welcome to PsyCal. I'm Kyle. And I'm Stacy. And this week we have a special guest, uh, Bill Zabub. Uh, if you do not know Bill, he makes um, I, I get... some of the craziest films you will ever ever see in your lifetime. Yeah, I don't know where the uh, thought process starts with someone like Ant Farm Dickhole and Jesus Christ Serial Rapist. Uh, he's definitely not for everybody. Um, but, I mean, mad respect for him for doing what he wants to do. Exactly. And... You know, I noticed he said he doesn't work with a budget. He's like, I have no budget. Right. That's, that's like, he's like, I'm just doing what I want to do, and that alone. True that's, indie. Yeah, 100% well, my respect for that. Yeah, and, well, the B-list movie scene, it, it's kind of big right now. There's a huge uh, following with it, with uh, Thanks Killing. The third one just came out. They skipped the sequel. But yeah, and it was amazing. <laughs> uh, with, like, Ginger Dead Man 3. I mean, a lot of people like B-list because they like laughing, but they like... Uh, monsters as well, I guess. Um, yeah, tr- and it's, go ahead. it's honestly really, really hard to find good monster movies anymore because it just seems, I mean... It's yeah, just, ever since just, Poultry Guys, it seems like it just died out. Yeah, every... <laughs> That's a excellent choice, I guess, but um, I don't know, like, it just seems like Hollywood is so into the remakes right now that... You know, anything original is either sitting on someone's desk and they're just ignoring it. But we just need a really good monster movie out there. Yeah, the only monster movie we have right now is uh, Guillermo del Toro trying to put out um, fucking Ghost Mama. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there's no more monsters in movies. And, I, and uh, with Bill, he even brings out monsters from time to time with, like, Night of the Killer Pumpkin. Right. And that's 100% my respect, even if it's just this low-budget put a pumpkin on somebody's face type deal. Have you seen that movie? I have not. Oh my god, it's 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 ridiculous. <laughs> I would assume so. Just alone, like, I was watching interviews with Bill. I think he was at, oh, whatever conventions up, Cinema Wasteland up in Cleveland, and he was just having the time of his life down yeah, there. We're about to interview him now, um, so uh, I guess without further ado, let's get to the interview. So we are here with Bill Zabub, uh, and he is a horror icon in the... Would you like being called the king of B-list? <laughs> <laughs> king of Z-movies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, everyone is calling... His new moniker, I guess, is the king of B-list. That's actually a movie coming out dedicated to you. Did you have anything to do with that? Oh, uh, let's see. What is the official story of that? Uh, a Victoria's Secrets model likes my movies... And after seeing my documentary, she decided I'll make one the same way, which means that it'll be bad. <laughs> and see, I, so I, I I released some footage for that, and a lot of that footage is stuff that I guess you could call it bloopers or behind the scenes that was from my sex horrors. And the reason why they never appeared on sex horrors is that I didn't want to break the illusion. So, um. The reason for that is, like, Breaking Her Will is a movie where uh, you're supposed to be disturbed the whole time. And if you see behind the scenes of us laughing, yeah, uh, it'll destroy the illusion. So uh, I just now realized, after all this time, that if you see that movie, the illusion is going to be destroyed. So I might as well have put it on the horror movie itself. Well, that's anyway. kind of like that Forgive Me For <laughs> Raping You movie. I mean, that movie went way away from your kind of typical horror movie comedy kind of thing. Yes, uh, what can I say about that? I wish that we had more time to do it. I might have cast it differently, but uh, maybe it was experimental. I don't know. Is that one of the movies you've seen? Oh, yeah, I saw it last night. Okay. It was um, yeah, the... It was a little different than what I was used to seeing from you. Yeah, well, I guess... How can I put this? All right, I just now parked, so I can give you my full attention. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take my seatbelt off. Ugh. All right. I accidentally discovered that the so-called sex horrors make a lot of money, and rather than being the kind of guy who makes movies for money, well, that came out wrong. <laughs> I... <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, l- let me start that over again. The 
sex horrors I found out sell very well. But I didn't want to be known as a guy who makes roughies, uh, as they're, they used to be called in the 70s. Although, I think the movies I make are rougher than the roughies were. Right. Uh, anyway, I use the profit from those movies to make movies that are very high risk. And by high risk, meaning they'll be banned or they won't sell at all. You know, movies like Rap Sucks, uh, Dirt Bags, where it's very questionable if they'll even get into stores. You right. know, so this way, I can make the movie and not care about anything. Right. You know, I just make the movie the way I want to make it. So, which is why we have so much respect for you because you just have the balls to do whatever the fuck you want to do. In a world where everyone's worried about what Hollywood thinks and if they're going to make money off of it, you just do what you want to do, and that's awesome. Exactly. Well, I have noticed going to horror conventions all over the country that independent movie makers are ashamed of being independent. And they seem to be making demos for Hollywood, almost as if, you know, like, here's my movie. Uh, see, I, I abide by all your rules. Why don't you embrace me as one of your own? And that click is very hard to be part of. Right. You know, why not just enjoy your freedom? You're not going to make a name for yourself just following the rules. You know, uh, I take my cue from music. There are a lot of bands that in the beginning were hated, you know, what the hell are they doing? That'll never work. And they became forefathers. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'll ever be a forefather. but Well, I mean, <laughs> I think Stacy would agree that the independent scene, I think, is more alive than the mainstream scene. Because I think, uh, I, I know I do, I strive to see things that I've never heard of or things that I've never seen before. And you're not going to find that when you will go watch, you know, the fucking Possession or something that, you know, Guillermo del Toro is putting out. It's the same shit over and over again, just revamped. Definitely. And that's what I look for in a movie. I look for something that's going to shock me. I don't know why, but that's what I want. I'd much rather see that than some scripted, terrible Hollywood movie. I don't know why. Just sometimes those budgets really... I mean, that's why when I see a film called Ant Farm Dickhole or Zombie Christ, I have to watch it because it's something I've never fucking heard of before. Exactly. <laughs> so, <Yeah>, Ant Amp... <laughs> Farm Dickhole in a few months will be released in an alternate version called Human Ant Farm, and that's for the mainstream stores that were too afraid of the vulgar title. And the reason why it's an alternate version is I don't like to double-dip my fans. So, you know, every movie that I make, I try to have at least four different takes of each cut. So whenever you say somebody say, Whenever you see someone walk into a room, that's been filmed four times. You know, right. each shot is like that. So I'll, I'll try to put in shots that you've never seen, um, and maybe you have a different bonus movie. So if you are a fan and you see that and you're thinking, wow, I've never seen this before, and you don't read the synopsis, um, you know, you won't feel fooled at, at the end of the day when you, when you get home. You'll be happy that you have something a, a bit new. Well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, how did you get into the horror world? What made you want to uh, make movies? Well, the very, very beginning was when I received a video camera as a gift. The first thing I did was go out in public, and I interviewed people. That's actually preceding my magazine, and I think that that was how I developed my style of sort of being normal in the beginning and then getting very odd you know, seeing how far I can push people. Right. <laughs> so uh, I, I'd interview people in malls saying that I'm a college student, and then when I had two hours of footage, I'd contact everybody who participated, and I'd give them a dub. And then that went into uh, public stunts. I, I've always known derelicts. Uh, I've been a derelict myself, but you know, there are limits to the amount of damage my body can take. I've done that too. Uh, my my knees are terrible yeah. right now because I'm getting hit by a car. <laughs> well, you know, um, it, it wasn't unique to us. You know, when Jackass became popular, a lot of people said they, they were ripping me off. And what they didn't understand is, you know, m maybe if you're sheltered or if, if that doesn't occur to you, you know, that that's one thing. But people all over the country have have done things and filmed them or, or videotaped them, you know, back in the days of, of videotape. So I, I wasn't angry. Jackass never ripped me off, you know. 
I don't have a monopoly on going into supermarkets dressed as an old lady or whatever. Right. <laughs> uh, like knocking down displays and, and things like that, falling downstairs. But every young uh, male has done that kind of shit before. I mean, it, and they just had they just had the know how to go. You know, we can film this and make money on it. Yeah, exactly. We were well, doing it for free. We were stupid. <laughs> well, uh, I was doing that for free too. We were basically just entertaining ourselves. Uh, I was editing from VCR to VCR. And then one day at a party, there were, I don't know, uh, there are a lot of people who are in these public stunts, and they hadn't seen any of the footage, and I just asked if I can go into a room, turn on the TV, and, and put the VHS into the, <laughs> the VCR. I know those those terms might lose some of your younger audience. They're but... archaic now, yeah, no one knows <laughs> what the fuck that is. Yeah, so uh, anyway... By the end of the tape, most of the people in the party were trying to get into the room. People were howling. And it occurred to us that this is funny to people outside of us. And so I, I stupidly abandoned the the public pranks and I started making skits. They're just odd skits. And, and they were bad because I, I didn't really know what the structure of a story should be or a structure of a skit should be. I just started it as strange, it got stranger, and that ended in a way that, you know, you can never predict. But it wasn't really good story writing. I thought to make something funny, you cram as much jokes into it or as much funny stuff as possible. I didn't know that it actually had to have a story flow. And I guess you could say the same thing about my movies now, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but fast-forwarding many years of doing stuff like that, um, I was talked into making a full-length movie by a scream queen, and she said that she'd help me out and she'd get her friends to help out and that um, it probably will get picked up if they're in it. And so, I, as I said before, I, I didn't really know how to make a skit, let alone a full-length movie, so I, I bought a book by Sid Field about screenwriting, and I wrote Metalheads, and I filmed it as a practice movie, and... You know, it had Darian Kane and it had Susie Lorraine. And I forgot who else was in it. It had a Grimoire girl. Grimoire girls were girls in my magazine. Right. That That's a whole other topic. But essentially, it was a practice movie, but I paid the girls to be in it. And that separates me from a lot of independent people, even people who make movies for profit, and that even as a student of film, I paid people to be in it. You know, if a girl's even in a bikini, she gets money. So um, that I, I made a lot of VHS dubs and it got into the hand of a distributor, and I was asked, you know, what do I, what do I want for for the rights? Which was really bizarre because I was thinking like maybe in five years I'll be good enough to get distribution, but I got distribution on my practice movie. Right. Uh, by the way, that Metalheads is not the Metalheads that's available today. I remade it in. Uh, 2005, I think, because right. after the five-year contract was over, the distributor wanted to renew the rights. And I was thinking about just giving them a re-edit, and I looked at it, and I was thinking, oh, my God, this is terrible. <laughs> 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 I cannot let this continue. You kind of so pulled I, a, a I, worst I just... horror movie ever made. You remade the <laughs> No, Okay, so I spent last night watching both of them, and, and you told me – I, I'd seen the first, the original. I'd never seen the remake. And when I watched it, I was like, "You were so right. The remake is so different. It's, but it, it, it is a lot better." And it made me, it made me laugh. I was dying, I was dying laughing watching the remake. I'm so sorry that you <laughs> watched the first one. Now, <laughs> <laughs> I was talked into releasing it under my name, but it was basically just some friends having fun over the winter. Um, Except at the time I was inexperienced and I thought, you know, it's February, we can't film anything. You know, obviously that's not true, but back then I didn't know. And so I had six weeks where I knew I'd be paralyzed. I had nothing to edit. So six weeks was all we had to write, edit, uh, write, film, and edit. And um, each, we were supposed to replicate the movie, and for those of you who don't know who, Repli <laughs> who Replicate is, it's my uncle. No, uh, Replicate <laughs> <laughs> is not burning a DVD. It's, you know, the factory stamped 
DVD that's the uh, retail version. You know, it's not a burn. A- anyway, we're each going to contribute. You know, th- we began as 13 people, and it ended up being seven divided by 1,200 or how, ma- how much it cost. And we each got our own allotment. And then um, because they fooled me into putting my name on the movie, uh, the distributor wanted it. The reason why I'm staggering is I don't want to tell the story. I don't want people to <laughs> go out and find that version. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but basically, I, I'm ashamed of it. I, I wouldn't be ashamed of it as a home movie or something that was fun for friends to do. Right. Uh, you know, to pass time, but that's not really something um, for fans. The remake. You know, or, or for the general public. <laughs> and like you said, the remake was was so much better and it was i mean in the i think the comedy in it was so much it was delivered so much better you know what i mean it's because i actually put effort into it <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know i was so desperate to have the first version destroyed that uh i told netflix the, the guy who worked there at the time uh the acquisitions guy listen if you send back the first version, I will send you double the amount in the new version. Right. You know, the, I will admit one thing that you might find interesting about that whole fiasco. Until then, I had not made a horror movie. And I was just dreaming of the day when horror critics would would have a horror movie for me to, to write about, horror sites. Because I... I <laughs> I was going to horror conventions selling comedies, which was really funny. It was also aggravating the people who were next to me watching comedies outsell their horror movies. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, Netflix immediately wanted 900 copies of the movie when it came out. And then a week later wanted 800 more. And so I could have ridden that cash cow because, you know, if Netflix was, was ordering that amount, Imagine what everybody else would want. Right. But then I happened to read a review from a, a horror writer. I usually don't read. Or, yeah, uh, you, you can't reviews. read reviews. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's different from fans or people personally writing to me because I, I think that I learn from criticism, and I also want to know what makes people angry. But <laughs> uh, the review was spot on. You know, there was... Uh, I didn't take insult to it. I, I almost felt like apologizing to the guy for making him watch <laughs> such a bad movie. But but I realized that that was career suicide. If any more of those copies get out, and if people equate my name with that movie, I, I'm finished. So uh, I destroyed everything I had, except for one, just as a reminder, never do this again. Uh, but I wanted <laughs> Netflix to get rid of all theirs. Uh, ev- every appeal I made to them to just destroy them, I'll, I'll replace them, sell on deaf ears. Uh, I think Netflix has both copies or both versions available. I-, I wanted to ask fans to rent the first one and then scratch it so it's unplayable. <laughs> but I think that I would be liable if if I actually went ahead with that request, but I I am ashamed of it. And people seem to have great delight bringing that first version to me at horror conventions for me to autograph. (laughs) They're just kind of rubbing it in your face. You hate this. Uh, this. (laughs) Well, it's just like buggy potty training or house training where you rub his nose into the crap (laughs) and he won't do it again. So I will never do that again. (laughs) Did you want to get the next one, Stacy? Is she there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had my mute button on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a I'm a woman trying to figure things out, I guess. But um, at least you know. Yeah, I do know. I'm aware. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I know you say you don't like to uh, read reviews that much. But have you ever gotten like somebody that's just like full on rage with one of the movies <laughs> that you made? Uh. Back in the days of MySpace being um, relevant, 
I had about 13,000 friends. I, I don't know how many friends are on there because pretty much logging in there is just asking for spam. Nothing yeah. else. It's true. <laughs> um, so I rarely go on there. I know that people in other countries still use it. So just in case somebody from <laughs> somewhere else is trying to contact me, uh, I'll, I'll log in. But I think the the name of the site is somethingawful.com. And I guess one of their writers or one person with the site noticed that I had a pretty sizable following and decided to review a movie. And the movie that he decided to review was that very first movie, Metalheads, which, as I said <laughs> before, was my practice movie. It wasn't the remake. And... The person hated the movie so much. He began the review by saying it was a waste of time to watch, but his review was so long that scrolling down forever led to a page two. It was so long that I couldn't even <laughs> oh my read God. it. <laughs> what movie was it? <laughs> it? It was Metalheads, the first oh, Metalheads. Okay. Um, so... I don't mind being insulted because I based my career on being insulted and being hated, but I don't abide people being tough on the internet, and the review sort of was like that, and so he was on my list to bitch slap because I travel, <laughs> and <laughs> and so I don't live that way anymore, but it, it was all from the magazine days where I used to really insult people, and it wouldn't be really funny if I were just the person who hid. So I had to go to every show possible and answer every challenge. You know, at, at least face people. You know, right. So uh, I carried that over into, into the movies, and I was thinking, you know, this guy has to be confronted face-to-face. -face. But, it, you know, it's the other side now where I'm going to slap him rather than I will be slapped by him. Um, so... Part of me was thinking, you know, if the site is called somethingawful.com, could it be that they just rip everything apart? Right. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> just thinking, like, why would why would the guy choose a movie that's my very first movie, you know, and not even remotely the best one? Well, I know that site too, and that's what they do. It's like Rotten Tomatoes. I have beef with, but because you know they're they're bullshit too. But at least <laughs> they they watch everything and rate it accordingly to how they feel. With websites like Something Awful, they, they look for things that they see on the internet that are either intentionally bad or or they, that people complain about a lot. They watch it and they do their, their bullshit reviews. Right. Well, ultimately, I was very happy for that review because I can't imagine anyone reading the whole thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say. <laughs> they'd, I, they'd rather watch the movie. <laughs> I, I couldn't. But, but the thing is... Uh, Back then, I used to track traffic from my site uh, in preparation for monetizing it. Uh, there, I've never monetized my site, so I don't really care about that. You know, um, tracking is pretty much for for showing advertisers, like, look, this is how many people right. come and say hi. Uh, but that review resulted in thirty thousand additional unique visitors because I had a baseline; I knew how how many people visit. And then I, I said, that's not that bad. And then I had a spike in sales for that. I was a little aggravated because that's not the movie I want people to see as the first Bills Above movie. But but actually, it was the first Bills Above movie. Well, I mean, it is appropriate. bad reviews are good reviews, really. Because when someone tears your film apart, everyone wants to see it now. Exactly. Yeah, I... As I said, I built my reputation on, on being hated, being called the worst, and so uh, you can't hurt me by saying that to me. Right. I just I just get mad when people are tough in the reviews. Oh, it drives me crazy. That, like, they would never say that shit to your face. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, what what attracts you to use uh, Debbie D? And I know Carrie Taylor's been in quite a few of your films as well. But I know Debbie D's kind of like the... I, I guess the quote unquote queen of B list because she's in so many B list movies. I think she does the, uh, the, I forget what they're called, but like the tapes that people like recommend them do, you know, people do. She, she's in those a lot, right? 
Well, if you want me to be honest, I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, I've had a learning experience with people like that. Um, I met Debbie D on the horror convention circuit. She was uh, actually next to the Darian Kane table. Darian Kane helped me in my early days. Okay. You know, actually, she is the person I referenced before who told me that I should make a feature-length movie. You know, because um, until that point, I thought that I was just some clown making skits, and that's all I'll ever be. I was more interested in being a magazine publisher than, than you know, making movies. And I re- didn't really think that people would find my my stuff entertaining enough to actually justify putting time into it, you know, the serious time into it. But anyway, Debbie D was very charming in person. And as we got to talking, she, she said that she would be in the movie. I forgot what her first appearance was. Um, but I made this comment about fake boobs. Yeah. Not knowing that she has fake boobs. <laughs> you, you didn't know? <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. I, wait. Know, like, I never she, saw her uh, I was gonna say, yeah, topless. I was going to say, has she been topless yet? Because they're kind of cross-eyed. <laughs> so uh, her her boobs were so cross-eyed that <laughs> every time I filmed her, I had her wear a half bra where you couldn't tell that they were right. fake. You know, because uh, I don't know how you feel, but I don't like fake boobs. No, and terrible, if but... I'm making... If I'm making a damsel in distress kind of a situation on, on camera, I know that men probably find it very hard to believe that a girl who's had a boob job would be embarrassed about being naked. Because, you know, th- there's a whole degradation factor to, to those scenes, you know, humiliation. Right. If I had a penile implant, I'd be walking around the street like, oh, I didn't know my pants were down, and let me put them back up. <laughs> you know, this <laughs> <laughs> you know, I would be embarrassed to be naked with a sizable reconstruction. But anyway, um, I also didn't know that although she was charming in person, her acting was, to put it the best way possible, comical. Right. You know, it's great for, for a comedy. Um, or a cheesy sci-fi movie. Well, I, I, I'm trying to keep this very lighthearted uh, but in in the early days, it didn't really matter because I was I was shooting on camcorder. Right. Back then, I didn't know what 24 frames per second was. I didn't know that that's the magical cinematic motion. That's what makes movies look like m- movies, and that's what makes camcorders look like news ca- broadcasts or whatever. Right. You know. Uh, you know. All, all these directors at the time were saying like, "Oh, if you do this to the color, if you light it this way, it'll look like film." No. <laughs> the primary thing is the cinematic motion, the 24 frames per second, opposed to the 20, the 30, and also the depth of field, which um, I guess might be too much of a technical chat. Uh, getting back to WD, it was a uh, sad discovering, you know, the fake boobs. Uh, as long as a person's nice, I will work with that person. So. Um, the niceness ended when I asked Debbie D to play a mother. <laughs> right. And she flipped out. <laughs> really? She said, well, how, how old is the girl? Because no one's going to believe uh, I get carded for cigarettes. Uh, I, I better wear a wig with gray hair. And she has a problem. She doesn't realize that she looks her age. She, I, I guess in her mind she thinks that she could be playing the teenage roles or the young last roles. She doesn't see herself as, as old, and I didn't know that that was a sensitive spot, so she flipped out completely. But, I mean, it's not like she looks old. I mean, she looks her age. I mean, she looks good for her age. I mean, it's not like she's, you know, the chick from Titanic. You know, <laughs> you know she's <laughs> – I mean, she's not ugly or old. She's she, I mean, but, yeah, I could see her as a, as a younger mom. No, I, I thought she was curvy, and uh, toward the end of working with her, I, I knew that her acting was just bad. I, I, I think I even got rid of her speaking parts, but but whatever. Uh, you know, once 
there's an outburst like that, I was thinking, all right, I, I hired you when, you know, you were a joke and people were asking me, why am I working with that idiot? Uh, so, you know, that was my goodbye. All right. And then Carrie Taylor was another person who, um, if I may begin with the compliment, uh, I think that she has incredibly shapely legs, but she's another person who has a, a you know, fake boobs. So same thing with her. If, if you've noticed in the later movies that had her in them, I hid half of her breasts, you know, with a half bra or something. So you couldn't see that they were fake. Right. Um, but she was very much hated by other models. I would, it, she's not an actress. She's a model. Right. And you know, for the damsel in distress stuff, uh, I wasn't doing it for drama. I was doing it more for the perverts to, to buy those movies so I could fund the comedies. Um, where am I going with the Carrie story? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so other, other, other directors hated her too. And so when someone's hated, I always support the underdog. So I made it a point to hire her when other people didn't, but, you know, models would flat out tell me if she's in the room, they don't want to be there. They don't want to work with her. They'll be in the same movie, but they don't want to work with her. Why? So I, I, I don't know what she did, but she was also a, a big gossip hound. Yeah, she so, kind of uh, looks like she might be. So um, I don't I, – I still haven't figured out if any part of that is malicious, but some people just really love to gossip. Yeah. Uh, but that's – that's dangerous when you don't care if the gossip is based on reality. You know, if if, if you like gossip because of its juiciness, then that, that's a problem. And it, it seems that she uses that variety. But I still don't know if it was malicious. But uh, it it was another case of biting the hand that feeds you. Right. You know, like I was working with someone who had a bad reputation, and I was happy to be supporting someone who's shunned by others. And, uh, so that, that ended, you know? Right. Um, but a, a big secret, you mentioned my movie Crucifier, right? <laughs> which, um, uh, <clears throat> is not a good movie. When I, when I have movies taken out of production uh, or out of circulation, it's either because the movie was made as an experiment and I found out what I wanted to find out or, you know, maybe it was a mistake putting the movie out, and Crucifier was that category. It was a mistake putting that out. But anyway, it was during a time when I didn't really have a lot of horror knowledge or horror experience, but I had this idea for for, for the movie, and I wanted Carrie Taylor to play the lead, but I knew how bad her acting was. So to compensate for it, you know, it was the equivalent of putting a bra on a fake... <laughs> or a half bra on a fake boob. Right. Uh, I had to wear a mask the entire movie. <laughs> 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 so you couldn't see the bad acting. You just saw the shapely legs and whatever. Um. <laughs> and that's why you're a very talented director. <laughs> but by the way, you are the only person I've ever revealed that. Even in the King of the Bee movies, I didn't talk about that. Yes, we got a psycho. <laughs> I've never... I've never told anyone that other than uh, Rocco Martone, who played her uh, co-star. Right, and, and that he he runs uh, Dingbats, correct? No, uh, he drinks beer there, but he... <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't run it. I like that we have a psycho exclusive of Bill's above. <laughs> that's, that's about Carrie Taylor. <laughs> so again, that stuff is not... Uh, that I said about Debbie Deer Carrie, that's just truth. Right, right, you know, right. I, I, I never said it to anybody because no one ever asked about those people. Um, but that, that's the story. I, I protected them for for all that time in the past, but, you know, if they're going to be nasty, uh, you know, screw them. Right. I never screwed them, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's the number one question I get asked. Uh, I don't have sex with the girls in my movies. Is it because, I guess, aren't a couple of them, like, porn stars and models and that kind of thing? I guess they just assume that you do that? Because I think, um, I can't remember her name. I, I, I couldn't even tell you how to pronounce Gina it. Gina Lynn? Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Isn't she a, um, a porn star? Yes. Yeah. 
She, I mean, she, I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's funny with Gina Lynn because in person, she... It's not just me. She had an effect on every guy who who encountered her that day. She has these eyes. You, you know, <laughs> your IQ drops 20 points and all you want to do is procreate. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, but the thing is, in the beginning, I've seen people, ugly guys who make movies, who only get action with. Uh, right. Uh, how do I say? It? Do, do I need to explain? No, no. I never. I, I never wanted to be that. But also, uh, I actually tell people who've never worked with me before. Uh, I give them sort of a sexual harassment speech. You know, the the girls can flirt with you, but you can't flirt back. Right, right. You know, because when they're flirting with you, they don't mean it. It's almost like going to a go-go bar and believing, like, oh, she loves my hair. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a billion dollars. You know, they're, 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 they're just trying to make the work environment uh, friendly and fun. But, you know, that flirtation isn't meant. But I, I have found out that, Models, uh, there, there are some models who have drug problems or mental illness, and uh, I haven't experienced it personally, but, you know, there's something wrong with, with that. You know, like, um, as a director or producer, I'm the boss, and for me to, you know, use that to to get anywhere with a girl, it, it's just stupid. You know, okay. it's, it's pathetic. However, when I get older and uglier, I will be doing that. Yeah, the back, just, the back now, of the Now, I, I just don't want that to be t- said about me now. The back but later, I, I, do, okay. I do plan to make use of that. <laughs> <laughs> that is well, there's the future plan, though. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never want that said about me these days. Right, right. <clears throat> 60-year-old Bill. <laughs> I I don't plan to live that long, but that's how that's what I keep saying too. Me either. <laughs> you, uh, but you yeah, I, go ahead. Oh, sorry, I have another question, but you can go ahead and go with what you're going with. No, uh, the one thing you must understand about me is that uh, I open the stream of consciousness and I talk a lot, but I don't really say anything. So you have to stop me when I talk too much, or you have to <laughs> orient me back to what the subject is. You and I have a lot in common. I can't shut my mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, you uh, you do a lot of conventions. Is there any conventions you always look forward to every year? Yes. Uh, Cinema Wasteland in Ohio, uh, cinemawasteland.com. Actually, next year, 2013, that's the only convention that I plan to attend. Well, then I'm going to um, come up and see you. Yes, I, I might do one in New Jersey, but only because uh, a friend of mine who's a director, Mike O. Mahoney, he did, um, oh, what the hell, Sloppy the Psychotic. He and I have a lot of fun. He's also in my new movie, um, Jesus, the Daughter of God. But right. I didn't really mean that as a plug. It's just that that convention, we're not going for any other reason than to make fun of the flea market people who go there. It's, it's not a convention, it's a flea market. So, <laughs> Well, isn't that uh, kind of like, I met you at the uh, North Carolina, the Rutger Hauer's, um, what was it, Mad Monster Party? Yes. What, what a joke that, I felt so ripped off when I got in there. I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> really? I, I couldn't stand <laughs> it, I hated it. I, 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 I don't know. Um, but it was it was smaller than I thought it was gonna be. I guess I'm used to going to the larger ones. I, I've been to the one in Atlanta, um, and I guess I, I guess you know bigger town. I guess I don't know. But yeah, I, I was I, you know I got a picture with you. That was kind of, that was the highlight of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just happy that they played Ant Farm Dickhole. They they actually were looking at at several movies and we're having trouble figuring out which one, which is the opposite of some conventions that will never play my movie, <laughs> right. like the one in New Jersey. Uh, Mike Owen Mahoney and I, we were trying to get thrown out. You know, we, we were vending. <laughs> <laughs> we were telling people, sorry, your T-shirt's too gay to buy a movie from us. You or, gay, uh, copy, so I must have looked pretty badass. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
<laughs> or, or yeah, well, well, you know, I actually had fun at Mad Monster Party, and I was worried about North Carolina because I'd heard such horror stories about the Bible Belt. Yeah, it's so like, I I do have balls, like not knowing what I was in for. I've gone to Texas, I've gone to North Carolina, I've gone to Kentucky with movies called Jesus and the Total Douchebag. Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and you made it out alive. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I had a great time, and I think that the viewing for Ant Farm Dick Hole was one of the loudest ever. I wanted to you go know, so that... bad, but a friend that I was with at the time, he couldn't stay that late. I, I, I thought, yes. So you gave me a copy, and we came home and watched it, uh, and, and he's not a fan of horror movies. He's like, what the fuck are we watching? He doesn't understand the difference between <laughs> you know a, a mainstream horror movie and someone that's just making whatever the hell they want to make. True. Uh, I, I I have seen. I, I guess people are. What is the word? I don't want to say spoiled, but uh, in my history, when I saw John Waters' Desperate Living, uh, I don't know if you've yes. ever seen that movie. Oh yeah, John Waters is a favorite of mine. One of the best. But I couldn't believe how good the movie was, and I didn't know what low budget meant. I didn't know anything about that. I just loved the flavor of the low budget. My budget is significantly lower, by the way. Right. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't have to be taught to love low budget. You know, the the sitcom, the young ones, the British sitcom, you know, cheesy as hell. Right. But I loved it. So I love cheesiness. Uh, but most people don't. You know, I've tried to get turn people on to Desperate Living or the young ones, and they yawn. And it's beyond me. And it doesn't mean that people are stupid. It's just that, you know, humans are diverse. You know, there are some people who are very good at just taking orders and not thinking, and they, they're they unemployable, and they join the Army. And <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, um, you and I, we have different uh, skill sets. And, you know, as a population, some people – have to not be able to like these movies because <laughs> they're the ones who actually get other important things done. You know, like right. they're the ones who will go, um, you know, on Scott, uh, on girders, you know, steel workers and stuff like that. So, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with those people. It, it's just the people who go out and try to ruin uh, things for me or other independent uh filmmakers you know those are the assholes but if you don't like the movie that doesn't make you an asshole it's just if you try to destroy me that that then you're yeah. an asshole well do you like um interviewing musicians on uh, metal retardation or do you like making films more i like it all uh i'm just happy that i don't have one type of outlet for the creativity right you know um the interviewing with the band that's remnants of my magazine uh, I'm actually going to be making a movie called Fanzine Editor. The reason why I haven't really done it before is I didn't think that anybody would really want to watch it. And it's going to take a lot of effort to put that movie together. And so I always have to weigh decisions like, uh, you know, can I spend that much time working on something for nothing? You know, because I, I do actually have to eat. Right. Otherwise, I won't be fat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and then no one will recognize me. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, the interviewing with the bands usually it's a lot of fun, and sometimes it's just meeting old friends, and other times it's it, it it's having fun. In the magazine, readers could only imagine what it was like right. interviewing with a band, and, and sometimes people got mad because. They invented the situation in their heads. They didn't realize, you know, that it was all sarcastic. But when you see it, it should be obvious, although it isn't, believe it or not. Uh, right. I just I just realized that that's not true. There are just people who are dense, you know, and I guess that's a kind of stupidity. <laughs> they take things as things are. They don't really but, think but, into it. But it's so obvious, you know, to me. Like when I ask a question, uh, there's a band here from the Faroe Islands. And I made some kind of joke question about, um, I, I didn't realize that Egyptian kings 
you know, came from there. Are they buried there too? You know, the Faroe Islands, get it, right. Faroe, Egypt. And <clears throat> <laughs> so on YouTube, the reason why I disallow comments unless, you know, they're personally approved is because there are a lot of stupid people out there and I couldn't believe the amount of people who corrected it. Like, no, Pharaoh is spelled, you know. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, like, that wasn't a real quote. How could you? It says mental retardation. How could you think that any of that is serious? You know, but, uh, you know, metal, <laughs> I, I forgot that, you know, because I'm a certain metalhead and I only associate with other kinds of metalheads who, you know, we may not like the same bands, but we basically have the same understanding. Right. You know, there are dumb metalheads. There's a dumb metalhead stereotype. You know, there's the rebel antisocial metalhead. Uh, there's the poser Motley Crue is metal, which is it isn't. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, in, in the movie Metalheads, I, I made the, the comment that the only time that the word baby should appear in a metal song is when it's about killing babies. I was about to say, when you're killing, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, it's not like, I love you, baby. When you get flung into a giant woman's vagina and you shoot it with a laser gun. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But I I, I don't know if you had a follow-up question to the the metal interviews. Uh, I, I do enjoy interviewing those bands and, I, I think you had emailed me or someone, ah, <laughs> I did an email interview today with someone who actually asked me if I made the black metal documentary totally contrary to all the uh, expectations. You know, I actually showed black metal people laughing. Right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know if, if you are a fan of, of that type of music or, or not. But... I'm a metalhead and I, and I, I like, uh, I guess I like black metal to a certain extent, but I guess I'm, my generation, I guess I'm more into the newer metal with the screamo, kind of, not screamo, but the screaming and the heavy lyrics and shit like that. Like, um, so I don't know if you know, Suicide Silence and that kind of thing, the real heavy, I guess they call it grindcore now. I don't, I, I don't, titles are ridiculous, but I'm into every, every kind of metal. Um, titles are not ridiculous. I am king. <laughs> <laughs> That's that true. Beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, to sum that up, there are documentaries that continue to perpetuate the sensationalistic aspect of the, the black metal. There, there was one documentary, Headbanger's Journey. Uh, oh, I, love I think it. it was also played on, on TV. But there's a guy, Gaul, who was interviewed, and you know he, his face was underlit, almost like a kid playing with a flashlight. Right. And uh, he's drinking wine and being very serious. And he's asked a question, and he just took time and then just said, Satan. Satan. Yep, Satan. Yep. <laughs> you remember that scene? Yeah. All right, so he was evil in that documentary. In my documentary, he came out of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Stacey, so that's you have some questions. I, I keep talking over you. I apologize. You want, you want to ask some questions? <laughs> fine it's totally okay i was going to ask uh the ideas behind the movies i'm going back to the movies are pretty crazily amazing like the stuff the ideas you have are something like my brain cannot put together what triggers some of those ideas i don't know if i've ever revealed before but in the early days I think my first seven movies were shot on camcorder, believe it or not. Right. You know, back back then, it, it was a lot of money. It was, it was nine hundred dollars for a camcorder. You know, why would you spend so much? I don't know. Because I I never looked at myself as um, a professional. To me, it was just a hobby that paid, and I had no idea why I still had distribution. You know, uh, <laughs> good reviews were few and far between. But anyway, um, there's a rule in business, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And so I was looking at other distributors, and they were all telling me that if I wanted to get my movies into video stores, the people who decide yes or no, 
the, the acquisitions people, they hate independent movies and they assume that they're crap. So within the first 10 minutes, you have to show them blood or boobs, but preferably both. <clears throat> and then, I don't want to say the name of the company, but there's a, a company that that puts out movies, I guess, for middle-aged men. They're not allowed to bring porn home, so they bring these, <laughs> right? these types of movies. <laughs> you know, when they go to horror conventions, they, they could bring these movies home, and, you know, they're, th these movies are tolerated. Um, but it seemed that, you know, the story was secondary. It, the story was just there to back up, you know, a girl stripping for five minutes, you know, with the transitions from scene to scene all being fade, like, ooh, I'm taking my bra off, and let me fade to me laying down, taking my underwear off, but you'll never see my pee-pee. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> so I made fun of that in all of my comedies. I had speed bumps to the plot, that that's what I call them, of <laughs> girls for no reason <laughs> taking their clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> or dancing for for five minutes long. Classic and, um, would be the worst horror movie, the remake. Uh, I think it was. I think it was actually Carrie Taylor towards the end. She was the vampire. You come up. You come up from eating her out, and you have blood all over your face. <laughs> and then she comes over and finishes the job because she's a vampire and she loves blood. I was like, it was like a five minute, just like girl on girl makeout scene. I was like, this is so fucking random. <laughs> yeah. Well, I. I must admit that I, I like nudity. I, I know it's unusual. <laughs> yeah, so unusual for a male to love, you know, naked <laughs> girls making out with each other. <laughs> but get, getting back to an earlier point, uh, from going around the country and talking to the independent people, they keep trying to get girls to be naked or, you know, scantily clad for free. And... I I never had that attitude even when I was I was making my practice movie. Um, and then Lloyd Kaufman, <laughs> do you know who he is? I saw the oh, interview. Yeah. yeah, I saw the interview with him. Where you, oh, on YouTube, right? Where you two were kind of not really butting heads, but I mean, he he has a very different viewpoint of what he does. And I mean, it's I mean, I don't know. He seems kind of like high and mighty in the B list world. <laughs> well, I have never read or seen his. Um, was it advice instructional series on how to make your own movie? But I've been told that there's a section on how to get girls to be naked for free. You know, and advice like shoot the nude scenes first because, you know, they might um, have cold feet or whatever. I don't know if that's true. But the reason why I was so belligerent in that, um, it was a horror convention that had me as a guest. And when I arrived, they told me I, I was to do a panel. And I don't like public speaking, believe it or not. Right. <clears throat> and so uh, before the panel, I drank as much scotch as I could. <laughs> 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 so uh, that explains why for most of that panel, I was retarded. You know, uh, to be no, fuck to, you, to Lloyd Kaufman. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are two reasons for the for the belligerence, you know, aside from the, from the alcohol. Uh, the guy in the middle, the night before, introduced himself to me. I still don't know who he is or what kind of movies he, he's done, but all he did was badmouth Trauma and badmouth Lloyd. <laughs> and then uh, on the panel, he's kissing his ass. And I was right. thinking, you know, that's not how you do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's not how you do it. <laughs> but, but the other thing is um, I didn't want the panel to become a Trauma commercial. You know, because every question ended up being like a trauma right. uh, answer. And then I know some girls who really should have been paid and, and weren't, but it's their own fault, you know. Yeah. <laughs> no one forced them to make the movie, but but they believed in the whole, you know, this is a great stepping stone. You know, I'll be naked in the movie for free and I'll get right. discovered. So I made fun of that on, on the panel, but of course I was drunk and... I really should have just not gone on the panel. You know, something like that is not a good surprise to spring on a person who just traveled ten hours to get there. Um, right. But I, I apologize to Lloyd about my behavior, and uh, I think segments of that are on King of the Bee movies. But um, is that out yet? I can't find that anywhere either. 
Uh, after this interview, or yeah, after this interview, just give me an address with movies that you have, and I'll send you a care package. Oh, that's <clears throat> awesome! Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, um, but what, what was <laughs> actually the the original question? Because I, I feel like uh, I went on this big meandering path and totally <laughs> avoided what you were asking. I don't even remember. <laughs> Um, oh, well, 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 well I, I think it had to do with uh, paying girls, because uh, it actually sometimes gets me mad, you know, like, guys getting, you know, crack whores or, you know, really, <laughs> you get what you pay for, you get right. what you don't pay for, I guess, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I'm always asked, how do you get girls to be in movies, and, and I stopped answering, because the answer is simple, I pay them. Right. Right. Money talks. <laughs> you know, of course, there there are girls who see the script and say, no fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but then there are others who, you know, they understand what the, what the scene is or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's no surprise. People never come on set and, you know, they're expecting to be reading a book in the library. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I want you to tied spread eagle to this bed it, it's <laughs> it's really essential to the plot well you know, they, they know i i never you know make this scene seem more or less than what it is you know i'm very honest about that it's not hard to get people to be in your movie you just have to pay them and treat them right right you no know, but if you go around asking people to do stuff for free of course you're gonna have a hard time yeah well you you talked about um well, I, I like talking about the movies. I know we talked about uh, everything else. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what's your? Um, why do you do the crosses so much with the girls tied to cross? I don't think you do it so much anymore. But I know in the first half, I say half of your movies, you always have the girls on the crosses. What is there something like that you just dig about uh, tying up girls on crosses? <laughs> in the early days, some fan sent me a link to a site, CrucifiedWomen.com. It's crucified-women.com. Uh, it's a guy from Belgium. He, he's had problems, and I think he resurrected the site a couple of days ago. Uh, but the reason why I was interested in contacting him is he had some art. I guess it was done in Poser, a 3D program. Right. And I wanted to get permission to use that for DVD cover. I ended up not doing that because... It would make the DVDs look like they're good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have to do a little aside here. My distributor lets me design my movies because I need for the movies to look like independent movies. Right. I don't fool the consumer. You know, like, how many times have you bought a movie... You're expecting Hollywood quality, and you get my quality. Oh man, well, <laughs> Netflix! Netflix is like the, the horror worst. scene on Netflix is like 85 percent B-list movies, which I'm all for. But if you have like a badass cover, I'm like, oh, that's cool. And then I watch, I'm like, what the fuck is this? It has nothing to do with. And it. I could, and, and like I said, I love B-list movies, and I would not mind watching it. But you gotta tell me ahead of time I'm going into something like a gigantic squid monster or some shit like that. <laughs> yeah, I. I don't fool people. I would be making so much more money. As a matter of fact, other distributors told me that the first thing that they would do is, uh, you know, they would have deceptive packaging. Right. <laughs> they don't put it that way, but that's exactly it. They would have deceptive packaging. And, you know, I never got into this for, for, um, uh, for money anyway. But, uh, I totally forgot my personal question. Well, let's go. Uh, let's move on. That's fine. Um, how real, um, I know. Oh, no, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remember because I had a point. <laughs> okay. I, I was gonna give you an exclusive, uh, revelation. Oh, let's do it then. Alright, let, let's pretend we have Alzheimer's. What the hell were we doing five minutes ago? <laughs> uh. <laughs> Alright. Um, so why was I talking about packaging? I said this is an aside and it became the topic. Hold on a second. We asked, um, what did we ask? Shit. I don't even remember. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, we go all. That's how we are, though. We go all over the place too. Um, shit. It's terrible having problems. <laughs> Was that it? This is the crosses. We. I, I asked you about the what? Oh, the crosses. Okay. All right. So, crucifiedwomen dot com. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> So uh, the guy had 
lots and lots of galleries of crucified women. And so for my first ever, I guess, exploitation, sex horror, kill the Scream Queen, which you should not watch. It's I terrible. Saw, I watched it today. I, I've seen it three oh! times. Oh! <laughs> I've seen it three times, Bill. I've seen that one, too. You have no idea how embarrassed I am. I should have never been in that movie. <laughs> I, I, I'm great at playing an idiot, but I'm not good at playing anything serious. Because I'm not an actor. I'm, I'm a great idiot. i got to say, the Viking you know? helmet would not scare me. I'd be like, what the fuck are you wearing? <laughs> the, the, the movie was just stupid. But anyway... I asked permission to, uh, I guess, print those pictures, you know, onto glossy paper to make it look like photographs. Right. And they were used in some scene in Kill the Screen Queen. Right. And then the guy started getting uh, video submissions from the photographers who took those pictures. Uh, I personally filmed some girls in the forest. <laughs> it looks like a forest, but it's actually a state park. And it's really funny because this one time a girl was uh, tied naked <laughs> to the... It wasn't a cross. It was, you know, a, a branch tied to a tree to make the tree, the, the, the crucifix. Right. But I didn't really think uh, I should have bought a blanket or something, you know, to hide her in case, you know, there's an interloper. <laughs> so this guy starts jogging. And so I tell everybody, like, shh. Hide, hide. <laughs> she, she, of course, can't hide because she's, you know, tied to this cross. That's, that's what you just look at him and you go, what's up? <laughs> I should have just filmed that whole thing because, you know, everyone's just frozen just watching this jogger and the jogger is so into his music. Like, he's just like, do to do to do and jogs without <laughs> noticing any of us. You know? <laughs> and then, that same park, uh, getting back to Carrie Taylor, uh, <laughs> she was topless. And um, of all the times of me going to that park, they had some kind of uh, like fake military training, and I didn't know that they were high school kids because they're from a distance. So uh, <laughs> anyway, two, two guys kept coming by us. Uh, in their camouflage, uh, not high school kids, but, you know, young guys, but, you know, definitely over 18. Right. And Carrie was uh, very angry about that. It, it, it's kind of weird to to picture that, you know, a girl who's topless in a movie not liking anyone peeping on her. Right. You know, the, the two things are, are the, the, there's, it, it's two different um, atmospheres, I guess, you know, because when, when you're, it's when I'm filming, it, it, it's comfortable. Yeah, because, you know, filming somebody is not the same as peeping on somebody. So I, I could understand, but she got so distressed that for the first time ever in dealing with an interloper, I did it the tough guy way. <laughs> and they called the police saying that we're shooting porn in front of the minors. <laughs> and so there were maybe 300 police who came to arrest <laughs> Oh my God. And, and at first I was thinking, you know, what the hell? And then I was thinking, you know, if I were a cop and I heard, like, porn, I, I would say, like, yes, I'll be right there, even though I'm in uh, China or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, it turned out that I know enough cops and I have so many PBA cards that it's like a, a playing deck. Right. Um, and it's so obvious that it was just, like, a spiteful thing that, you know, we were not shooting porn or anything like that. You know, if... if the sergeant who came onto the scene were a dick. Everything would have been confiscated. We'd all be in jail. But he just gave her a ticket, which I paid, because uh, I didn't know that in that state park it's illegal even to be in a bathing suit, sunbathing. Oh, wow. So he said it's not a criminal ticket. It's, it's just, you know, as if you're not wearing a seatbelt. And so I, I paid for it. And that scene is an ass monster where she's topless and so and she goes, oh, someone's here. <laughs> right. That's that's the pre-arrest uh, fiasco. You know, that's real life. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, that's a revelation, too. I never told anybody that. I like you know, it. That, that's we get, we're yeah. getting so many excuses. I know, this is amazing. But, but the, the crucifixion thing, it was just a matter of I had access to people who were shooting things like that. Because generally, I never tie anybody up in real life. You know, right. People look like they're tied up. 
the only exception ever was in the woods, you know, the girl on the cross. <laughs> right. But she wasn't suspended from the cross or anything like that. The crucifixion footage where girls are actually, you know, tied and, you know, suspended on these crosses, that's not me. I never filmed any of that. That's just, I was allowed to use that footage. I think most of it was by a Russian photographer who actually died. But I stopped using it at a time. You know, as a kid, you know, hearing about crucifixion, uh, I always wondered, you know, if you go to Catholic school, you always think that Jesus and two other guys were ever crucified. <laughs> but the reality is, you know, um, that that was actually a form of execution. It didn't really look like that. But I remember being in kindergarten, constantly looking at this cross. You know, back in kindergarten, we didn't really learn, you know, the, the fine points of religion. But when I was looking at Jesus on a cross, I thought it was a guy who had just gone out of a shower. Because I thought that was like a... I thought it was... I, no, seriously, I thought it was a shower towel around him. I didn't know that he, that was death. So, like, you know... So, halfway through kindergarten, I, I, I guess the cross was taken down to be cleaned or whatever, because, you know, it's at the top of the, of the wall. Right. And I, I looked, and there were nails going through his hands and feet. And I asked the kindergarten teacher... Why did they nail that in instead of uh, just gluing it? Because I thought it was like a, an arts and crafts thing. Like, instead of having a square, you just cut out the other pieces, uh, leaving a cross. I didn't know that it was like a guy hanging on a cross. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was absolutely horrified by that. That fucked me up. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I didn't know who Jesus was. I thought it was just a guy coming out of a shower. Now I know he's like, somebody nailed him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That was terrible. Um, so, <laughs> That's awesome. So then, you know, w when I was in my teens and I learned that, you know, you're really not on some high hilltop. You're pretty much ground level, like your feet are on the ground or whatever. Right. <laughs> you're not really up in the air. Uh, it, it's meant for you to be abused by passerbyers. And um, so I was wondering, like, what if you're – a condemned hot girl. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? That's the title of the you know, movie, Condemned <laughs> Hot Girl. <laughs> yeah, Condemned Hot Girl. I like um, it. So, whatever. Um, I, I don't use that anymore because there's really no reason. Just like I, I don't have like the sudden break of five minutes of a girl dancing. Although, <laughs> <laughs> in... Jesus, the daughter of God, my upcoming movie. I have a nod to a friend who died, uh, Terry Lofton. He's the director of Nail Gun Massacre. Uh -huh. He had asked me, why did I never have girls as villains or girls um, who kick ass or whatever? And I explained to him that in my movie, Night of the Pumpkin. Is that one of the movies you've seen, or yes, do I've I have to that. send it to you? I've, I've seen it. I don't own it, but I've seen it. All right. So one of the things in that movie... Actually, the only one I own is uh, Ant Farm Dickhole that you gave me. I've, I've, I've rented them. <laughs> okay. Well, in, in Night of the Pumpkin, I wanted to have a female lead who would triumph as a woman, not as a man. Because if you see movies like Resident Evil or whatever, yeah. the the female leads win by being masculine. They swear, they have a swagger, right. they fight. You know, th they don't accomplish things the way a woman would. And I'm not saying that in a secondary way. You know, like women are powerful in their own spirit. You know, uh, so that's why United the Pumpkin, the female lead, behaved the way she did, you know. Right. A man would have a problem appearing weaker, unless he's Eastern, you know, like uh, some of the Japanese martial arts. You know, your opponent is made to think that you're weak. You know, it's like, well, I don't really want to get to that. Because it's not a conversation about martial arts. It's about powerful <laughs> women. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's one of the subtle things, you know, uh, love it or hate it. That was, I think, the first time that ever happened in a movie. Um, I just wish I had a better budget and, you know, people who actually know what they're doing. Right. I'm not saying that about anybody involved in the movie, like as a bad thing. 
it know, was new. A bigger budget, in, a, in a bigger budget movie, you have a team right. <clears throat> that helps make the movie be the best it possibly can. So I don't have that team. You know, uh, and the ideas I had for Night of the Pumpkin, I really could use a team like that. You know, maybe that's one of the movies I'll revisit. Just like I have a serious version of Zombie Christ. But um, anyway, I was trying to explain to Terry Lofton that it's irresponsible, you know, to have like a rape revenge movie because that's not reality. Right. You know, uh, you know, rapists or, or serial killers or ser- uh, sexual sadists, you know, uh, it's unlikely that once you get in their grips that you're going to escape, let alone kick their ass, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, again, it's just stupid. It's it's more for, like, a simple-minded viewer. I, I don't want to do that. And, anyway, w- for Terry, because Jesus, the daughter of God, is a comedy, all of the girls in the movie kick serious ass. Right. They know how to fight better than their male counterparts. <laughs> And that's just my my respect, my final respect to him, that I, I did something that he had criticized about my movies. Because I always said it's unrealistic. But, hey, if the movie itself is unrealistic, why not have unrealistic parts, you know, at least for a friend like that, you know? Well, um, let's touch on one last topic. Um, if you don't no! <laughs> oh, I, I can talk all night. <laughs> No, go, go ahead. I have like seven <laughs> more questions, but I'm trying to tone it down because I know you, you, you've been on for an hour. <laughs> um, I, I know you probably get asked all the time about the Sandman movie. Um, I, 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 <laughs> did you not get asked about that movie? What was that? Do you get asked about that movie a lot? Because it seems like you would. Yeah, the, the funny thing is when uh, this year I try to go to as many horror conventions as possible. And everywhere I went, I got recognized, but primarily from Sandman rather than my own stuff. Right. Which it's kind of funny because I've always said that I I can only win if I lose at the same time. So I, I got recognized, but none of the people who liked my character ever bothered buying any of my movies. Right. <laughs> well, I can't find it anywhere, and I never get conventions. <laughs> oh. I, I, I live in South Carolina, and it's okay. I'm in the middle of hell. South Carolina. All right, yeah, so I'm in the middle of hell, I'm I want to move away so bad. Um, and so the only convention that really comes my way that I can actually make it to is that one in Charlotte, and uh, I'm not going there again. <laughs> wow. But, but with the uh, Sandman. Um, okay. How how real was that movie? Because I know I know your interviews, and I know the interviews he went through with people. But I know that Eric, well, his last name's not even Ross, I don't think, but um. How real was that? Because it just seemed like it was real staged to me. Speaking on behalf of uh, <clears throat> Fred from Totag and me, when we were interviewed, we were giving genuine answers. Right. The only difference is that I didn't know that J.T. Petty was a real director. I thought he and his crew were just college kids. Right. I grant interviews to anyone, as you know yourself. No, <laughs> yeah. no it's amazing what you say you're a college kid. <laughs> so, so anyway, um, I didn't really take the interview seriously. I, I don't mean that I was – how can I put this? If I had known that he was a real director, I might have tried to be more mature, and I'm glad that I was the idiot – <laughs> that was the comic relief in the um, yeah in the documentary. They saw how much I love beer, and they also saw that you know I don't drink to be mature. <laughs> right. <laughs> I I drink to be as retarded as possible. So um, so they kept feeding me beer, and um, th- I was interviewed actually on three separate occasions, and. You know, I was asked a lot of questions, and the editing is the fake part, right. but the answers were real. And some of the fake parts were, I actually had heat exhaustion, because it was during the filming of Kill the Screen Queen, which you should never watch, by the way. <laughs> um, and I learned that you should turn off air conditioning. That was the first movie. That, that's going back really far because that's when I first learned like oh you can't have air conditioned noise right <laughs> so I saw it on the hottest day in summer and turn off the air conditioning I didn't realize that what people do is between takes they turn the AC back on 
And so uh, I had heat exhaustion, and it made it look like I was drunk, you know. Right. Like so much because I was drunk. That was the scene with Carrie? Yeah. And yeah. then um, Carrie is just a person who gets bored extremely <laughs> easily. You know, uh, she can ask you, excuse me, how do I get to the movie theater? And while you're talking to her, she'll be bored in another <laughs> world. So so you actually have to drive her to the theater. Right. Uh, like, the attention span is really low. So, um, so anyway, her expressions, to be fair, who knows what's going on in her head, but they cleverly put her facial expressions to aid whatever the, the right. scene needed in Sandman, but not what was actually happening in reality. And um, Making you the other thing, know what you're doing. Yeah, and, and the thing is, at that time, I had only heard of Toe Tag. I've never met them. I've never seen a Toe Tag movie. And I was making a really bad effect on Carrie's back. And as a joke, I said, Toe Tag, eat your heart out, or August right. on the ground, eat your heart out. Right. Um, and I thought it was pretty obvious that <clears throat> that it was a joke, but it was cut in such a way as to make it an insult against him. So when I actually met Fred for the first time, I said, like, look, let's get this out of the way right away. I was not insulting you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so uh, we we become good friends. And actually, Toe Tag sells my movies on their site. Yeah, I saw you know, that. We, I saw that. Yeah. He's going to be uh, so, one of our guests in the future. Yeah, uh, those are all great people. And um, when you were talking about the underground, I, I, I did some interview today. Uh, I'm sorry, you're not special. You're not the only interview today. But, <laughs> um, <Damn it. laughs> but, but, but I was talking about there's not really an underground scene or a cohesive scene. But the thing is, you know, when I mentioned Mike Mahoney, who's in Philadelphia, director in Philadelphia, and we're splitting a table – toe tag um we make movies we don't encroach on each other's territories we're unique you know i would never make a movie the way toe tag makes they would never make a movie the way i make it. although i've talked to jeremy cruz from toe tag right about maybe collaborating you know having their sick hyper realistic gore with my bizarre demented you know it, it would be a sex horror, obviously. Right. But, you know, combining the two, what we could come up with. But that's that's just in the works. There's nothing concrete yet. That's just in the cloud. There's well, a big cloud of ideas. Again, you're really right about the way they edited the film. And editing is everything because in that movie, that there was the one scene where you were asked, I, I believe you were asked about or shown the August Underground Mortem where uh, I think her name's Krusty. She, she cut herself. And they made it look like you copied it. Yeah. And, yeah. They sent like you know you know the. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I think, <laughs> what movie was that? Into thy hands. Is that what the movie was that where uh, you were crossing off like uh, Mary Magdalene and was that that one? If I remember, uh, before Kill a Screen Queen, while I was still shooting on camcorder, I was making Jesus Christ serial rapist. Right. And. After three scenes, uh, <laughs> the guy playing the villain was actually the Nazi cop. I don't know if you ever saw stereotypes don't just disappear in a thin air. I, but I had a recurring I, character. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever there was a cop in the movie, it was a guy in a Nazi costume. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was this guy. and um, So I didn't know that I was breaking all of the rules of horror, but in a bad way. Right. You know, not on purpose to be cool or introducing something new. Like, the acting was terrible. It was shot on camcorder. The lighting was terrible. Everything was bad about it. So uh, that was another mistake I had where I was convinced to release it. Um, so there is an earlier Jesus Christ serial rapist that was released with a gaudy cover. Uh, right. <laughs> Debbie D was on the cover. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but... Um, I I was very, very quick to put that out of print because I was told it would only be available in in adult stores. That it would be a bondage movie. It wouldn't wouldn't really be. Cause it's not a movie. Only three scenes were were shot. Everything else was just, you know, like TNA and right. That, that had no <laughs> rhyme or reason to it. It was, it was terrible. Um, fuck. Uh, but anyway, when I remade 
Jesus Christ serial rapist because um, I like the idea of it, like the schizophrenic having a delusion of grandeur. Usually a delusion isn't grand. I, I was a counselor for schizophrenics, and one of my clients, his delusion was actually that he was a script writer. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So the um, thing is, you know, I was told, you know, don't confront people on their delusions. Right. Like, there's no medication. You, you can take medication for this or that, but there's no medicine that will release you from a delusion. Um, but just me asking him, rather than, you know, confronting him with evidence to the contrary, because it, it's almost like telling you, you're not on the phone with me right now. You're in a refrigerator. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're like, what the fuck? I'm not in a refrigerator. <laughs> but it is cold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So he had no idea what a three act structure is or anything like that. Um, so anyway, I, I thought like, all right, what if this guy thinks he's Jesus, but because he doesn't know anything about religion, he sees people around him reborn, you know, the people who fucked him over. Right. He knows like someone betrayed Jesus in the story. So instead of like killing the people, he's going to rape their girlfriends. Right. So that's why there was that, uh, tagline, um, First he nails you, then he nails you. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, funny thing is, I might make a comedic version of that because everyone who ever bought it, despite reading the synopsis that says this is not a comedy, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, expects a comedy and sees that. That's, I guess, the closest to a David Lynch movie. Not that you know I'm a big David Lynch fan, but it, it's just an odd movie. It's nightmarish. There's no dialogue. But I thought. In that movie, what if I actually cut myself with a razor? Right. And that was done without me ever seeing Toe Dag or whatever. Yeah. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. But, but yeah, I guess Sandman kind of um, made it look like things happened that didn't happen. Did you get in trouble for using um, the dolls that you did in uh, the Doll of Morte? You mean the ones with functioning orifices? Right, yeah. I was, I was, no, just, <laughs> you took time to make some vaginas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't get into any trouble. The funny thing is I, I, I took that out of circulation even before they were sold out. And I just went to this concert in Philly, and I gave out the, the rest, just keeping some for myself. Right. Because um, most people who told me about their reactions to the movie said that it sucked. They had no idea what the fuck the story was, even though I had sort of like cliff notes at the end. Right. Nobody could make rhyme. You know, nobody could understand what the hell I did. So I was thinking, you know, it would be pretty stupid of me to continue selling it when everybody who's ever told me about it hates it. Right. And then once it's out of print, everyone's like, ah, oh. where'd it go? <laughs> you know, so or, or people tell me how much they love it and how they watch it as a yearly tradition. And like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this one guy, Wild Eye for the Straight Eye, and that's what I call his um, <laughs> company. <laughs> uh, I let him release it, and I was thinking, why did I even do that? That that's a movie that should have just died, you know. Right. But as far as trouble, I I, I think you're asking me about, like, the toys or whatever. Right, I didn't know if the trademark infringing or anything like that, because, I mean, you did modify them, so, I mean, really, technically, you're not. <laughs> I know Gene yeah, Simmons well, was in there somewhere, so I'm surprised Gene didn't jump on that shit. <laughs> well, none, none of the things in there were representative right. of what they are. Like, there, there could have been a, a Barbie doll, but she wasn't, like, uh, orgasm-giving Barbie. She was, right. uh... <laughs> <laughs> the best Barbie of all. <laughs> you know, uh, and I, I think the band... I think I repainted the the Kiss dolls to have different kind of makeup where they were all King Diamond. Like a or, new Borgair kind of look to them. I, I, I don't really remember any of that, but um, I would love to make another doll movie knowing what I know now, but I think that would just be for fun. I don't, I don't think it'll actually be a product. But it, it is kind of funny that, you know, I thought it was just a denial syndrome, like it's out of print so everybody wants it, but... Uh, there are actually some people who really got a kick out of it, especially uh, vendors at horror conventions who sell toys. Right. They liked it. You know, um, and then there's always the... It, it seems that the more socially inept you are, the more you like my movies. <laughs> 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 or, or you like the movies that nobody else likes. You know, right. um, 
so I, I had a lot of that, you know, um, people who will probably never get married tell me how much they like Dalla Morte. But... <laughs> 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 well, um, on our show, we like to do what we call the Psycho Eight, where Stacy and I ask you eight eight questions um, that pretend. We do it every show that pretends to kind of the background of you. Um, and the first one is, what's the scariest movie you've ever seen of all time? All right, uh, <laughs> I have to ask something before you, you start. Okay, we'll, we'll do a do over. Is it one of those things where it has to be rapid fire, where I can't even think? No, 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 no. Oh. It doesn't matter. No, take your time. All right. We got all the time <laughs> in the world. <laughs> um, Avatar, baby. <laughs> That's a good answer. Oh God. Thank you for that. Thank you. I'm always saying that because um, give me just a minute. I'll, I'll try to make this as short as possible. I wanted to make a movie called the cheesiest science fiction movie ever made. Right. That's, where there's that, spaceships. Isn't that one of the spaceship movies you have coming out? Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> it's still in the writing phase, but I wanted to have um, spaceships with strings. You know, part of me wanted to make it black and white, but I know that that would annoy a lot of people. You right. know, so it would be in color, but it would sort of be like the 50s effects where I would actually try to make them good, but with very limited resources. Right. You know, um, so as I was thinking about science fiction, I was thinking about Star Trek and how Star Trek and some other programs or movies, they always try to have social messages. And then as a joke, I was thinking, like, what if I have an antisocial message? <laughs> <laughs> and then as, as, as I was thinking about, you know, the apparent social agenda in Hollywood movies, you know, um, I, I know that some of your listeners are, are going to hate me for the things I'm going to say, but there's nothing mean in what I'm going to say, even though it will sound crude and vulgar and hateful. But, you know, putting black people in unrealistic roles, um, you know, it's easy to, to buy into that if you don't come from a neighborhood surrounded by a really bad city. Right. You know, um, but it's like putting a spin on people that I don't like. And also certain ethnicities, when they appear in movies, they're Americanized, you know, they still have kind of an accent, but for example, like Oriental, they don't have articles in their language. So they don't say, give me the bike. They just say, give me bike. Right. <laughs> and, and so having them use American slang, uh, that has the articles, it's just ridiculous to me. Um, so in the cheesiest science fiction movie ever made, it begins with uh, a black captain of a ship stranding it somewhere. I, I play the black captain, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and the spaceship is going to have graffiti on it. And, <laughs> and all the high-ranking people are there because of our protectionist uh, policies, you know, like uh, things like social promotion, like uh, if you're black and in, in school, instead of failing you, you're just passed up the ladder because it's too traumatic for you to be left back. And that's why when you're in grade, you can't read. You know? Uh, so it, it's just these stupid political solutions to problems rather than scientific solutions to problems. You know, science is pretty damn uh, cold, but it's effective. You know, uh, but once government gets involved. I don't know how much I could say. I promise you it'll be a short answer. But anyway, um, all the uniforms are going to be clown outfits, you know, like really baggy. <laughs> and so a rebel crew of people who are actually educated, but they didn't get positions because, you know, there's token hiring and all that stuff. Uh, rather than fix the ship situation, they want to fix humanity situation where they accidentally learn how to time travel. So they're going to go back in time which is actually going to be our future. So things are going to happen like, you know, one of them gets mugged. I, I don't know if you've seen the original Star Trek, but some, sometimes they go back oh, to yeah. the present, yeah. you know. So let's say one of them gets mugged by a black guy, and he tells the police, like, the description. He's arrested for a hate crime because you can't accuse black people of a crime. You know, just, you know, in the tradition of science fiction, <laughs> over-exaggerating a point, you know, to make the point, um... So that's just one facet of 
the cheesiest science fiction movie ever made. And you have um, the killer clowns from outer space. <laughs> no, no, no. I actually am going to make a clown movie, and I've been asking people if there's such a thing as a clown genre, just like there's a, a cannibal genre. Yeah, I answered I, that. I, I, yeah. Oh, you're one of the people who, who, right. who uh, chimed in. Yeah. So it doesn't really seem like there's a clown clown genre, but there are clown movies, and I'm just right now making sure that I don't copy anyone. Right. When I make, when I make Holocaust Cannibal, I want to make sure. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's about, you know, I don't want to make it seem anti-Semitic, so it, it's probably going to be like uh, an inmate attacking the SS, because it's Holocaust Cannibal, not Cannibal Holocaust. Right. But um, that was on a back burner, because it, to me, it was just a one-joke movie that might have been just good as a skit. But then when I was talking to people who were actually part of the cannibal fandom, they were telling me what's required in a cannibal movie, and I said to myself, I could actually do this without trying to be funny. You know, because they require genital mutilation. I'm thinking, like, all right, the SS, they're uncircumcised. <laughs> they're <gonna be> circumcised. <laughs> you know, so I don't have to try to make it funny, but that that's actually like a, a, a back burner thing. You know, the cheesy science fiction movie is something that I, I really want to do now that, you know, I can make fun of all the things that are going on now, you know, um, and like the Avatar baby comment, uh, I, I refer to the movie as in outer space, and I'm, I'm saying it the vulgar way on purpose. It's just this love of, you know, it, there's a, a term called orient, orientalism, and I first came across it when I was studying Russian civilization about how the youth were romanticizing, you know, this group of people. Um, well, instead of talking about the Orientals in Orientalism, <laughs> which right. is where it, it springs, um, there, there's the peasants, the, the youth of Russia, you know, just really exaggerated how cool the peasants were, you know, and, and these students from, from, wealthy families, they were considered outsiders and assholes. And when they came to to the defense of these uh these peasants in, in villages and stuff like that, they were reported to the police. You know, this is you know, during dark times when, you know, you adhere to the social norms or you know right. fuck you. You know <laughs> Right. But but the point is, you know, it, it's dangerous to knock down a group of people, but it's also dangerous to raise them to these unrealistic levels. You know, so Avatar, I was thinking, you know, why on this other planet are people African? And why are they the spiritual, you know, and, and if it's science fiction, like, you know, right now with all, uh, brain studies, neuroscience, we, we see why we have, you know, these beliefs, why we stereotype and stuff like that. So we're getting away from spirituality, you know, we're, I don't want to get too heavy in, in this conversation, but science less fiction is what Avatar should be in movies like that. Hollywood right. is science less fiction. <laughs> well, and they're making two more of those things. I mean, it's, they, they're going to keep oh! going. Yeah, they're going to keep going <laughs> with this shit and, until no one goes. So, so I want to have, like, things like Captain South America and, and <laughs> right, you know, a movie like that. <laughs> You know, just to show the stupidity, you know, it, 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 it's really frustrating. You know, I don't really mean to knock down anyone's good time, you know, but as a person, I would really like to watch a movie that doesn't have rap music, that doesn't have, like, the silly exaltation right. of this or that group of people. You know, just let me fucking watch a story that I mean. I don't want to watch a Greek mythology movie that has a black oracle, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like, that's disrespectful. If you're making a cultural theme movie, respect the culture. You right. know, just because Hollywood has its agenda. I don't know, is racism really that big of a problem that we have to constantly show how bad racism is? And, you know, the, the new thing that I'm fighting is, you know, it's okay to make fun of rednecks. I don't know. If, <laughs> you probably make fun of them because you live around. No, oh, I, I, no I do. I do oh, daily. Yeah. But but the thing is, you know, it's 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 sanctioned. You can make fun of rednecks, like comedians do it all the time. 
And right. they make fun of them for being hateful people, but making fun of them is itself hateful. Right. Like there's, there's no, like, okay way to use hate. Right. You know? <laughs> hate is bad no matter what. So, um, you know, that, those are some of the points that I try to tackle. So even though, you know, I appear as an idiot, my movies appear idiotic and full of shock value, I do ask you to think. You know, I could be wrong. I've been reminded of certain things. You know, I've been corrected. But at least I'm not afraid to ask questions right. or to point out stupidity. You know, and if I'm stupid myself, I have no problem having that pointed out too. <laughs> <laughs> but th- that's why I like making these movies. And it seems that, you know, after I, I make a movie, what was the... And from Dick Hole had n- nothing really socially shocking, although it's kind of funny that it had the topic of bullying in it. Right. And, that, <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden, that's in the news everywhere. Um <laughs> I didn't do it on purpose for that. I was going to say, it's your fault. <laughs> no, no, I was taking a forensic uh, psychology class, and we just came across bullies for a second, and it was the first time I learned that bullies actually aren't like what your grandma tells you. They're not insecure. They're really secure. It's just that they're assholes. But <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, you have to... Say shut up, Bill. If I'm getting too far away, <laughs> no, we, say, shut- like I said, we love that you talk because a lot of times you will interview someone and they, you know, they once we say, "Hey, thanks for coming on for the hour." Once the hour's up, we're done. That's that's game yeah, over. That's it. <laughs> so, or, or it's a lot of work. I, I've actually interviewed bands the same way. They give one word answers, and yeah, you know, it's, it's really hard. And the Dimly Borger, uh, I kept wanting to interview Shagrath, the singer, right? But. He's not a very bright person, and I think he knows it. <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny to me, but it is. <laughs> uh, every, every, every time we interview someone, someone tells us about someone that is not, that is not too bright. I think the last yeah. time we talked to someone, uh, they were they were harsh on uh, Deborah Messing. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. Uh, you're not missing much. Oh, um, <laughs> you, do. you secretly do know who it is. Yeah, you're not, you're not missing much. <laughs> Uh, let's go to the next question. Stacey. The racial slurs. Are you going to bleep out my racial slurs? Because <laughs> you can tell that I don't mean anything bad. But it's, it's making a point. I always say that if, if you've got nothing to hide, you'll say the word. Like, when someone refuses to say the word, I think there's something wrong. Or the person's like an ultra-conformist. And one thing that I always say about conformists is, like, now these days, the conformity is political correctness. Those are the same people who would have been Nazis with no problem. Right. <laughs> you know, like whatever the flavor of the government is at the time, they'll, they'll be that flavor, you know, and so those are not to be trusted. Do not trust those people. Yes, men. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do not trust you. <laughs> you blew not it. at all. You blew it yeah. over there. So as, as a South Carolina person, if you don't mind me asking you a question. Oh, go for it. Are you Christian? Oh, no. God, no. All right. Um, Have, I, were you ever Christian? No. Uh, as a kid, I was raised in a Presbyterian church, and when I got to the age to where you start thinking for yourself, I was like, this is bullshit. <laughs> but um, I, I, I'm I'm not really anything. I consider myself religionless. If I believe in anything, it's Batman. <laughs> just and is, that, is that a rare thing in South Carolina? Oh, God, yeah. No, I, I, I've been cornered and Bible-beaten before several times, and, and that, I'm not even making that shit up. It, it's, that's a real thing. I, I, that's why i got to get out of the South. <laughs> a, a horror movie fan who is not Christian and, and I have you know sleeves of tattoos and gauged ears and shit like that, I don't belong here. <laughs> And I, I definitely don't fit in, so yeah, I gotta. That's that's my number one to do list is to get the fuck out of here. I, I asked you about that because uh, when I was in North Carolina, a lot of people prefaced their uh, praise of my movies with, you know, although I'm a Christian, I do find, you know, <laughs> right? They gotta let you know that they don't they don't technically agree with it, but they were entertained. Yeah, so I, I was just wondering how oppressive it was. The, the person I referenced before, uh, Terry Lofton, he read me constantly about me being an atheist. As a matter of fact, uh, he would never call me Bill Zebub, he'd call me Bill Zeb. <laughs> 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 and 
you know, when he first found out that I'm an atheist, we, he he came upon the discovery by asking if I was aware that my name sounds a lot like the devil. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and the funny thing is, Beelzebub is not the devil. He's a devil. Right. Like, that's one funny thing about fundamentalists. Like, everything is supposed to be word for word the truth, but they don't seem to know what the words are. <laughs> right. You know, like, Bill's above is not interchangeable with Lucifer. And Bill's above... The original history was uh, he was a Phoenician god who then became a, a demon. It, it's kind of funny, like, when your people are taken over, your gods become the lesser beings. Right. You know? Not, not in all cases, but you know, just... I... I just find it funny that people who wave a flag have no idea what their creed is. Right. You know, it just seems like a, a great way to tell the people what to do. But anyway, with with Terry, uh, I remember when he first found out that I'm a, I was an atheist, it seemed like there was a big distance between us. And then um, I try to make him understand that religion is not necessary for you to be a good person. You know, we're human and human humans are a social sp species. Well, we're a social species, humans. So we have to get along with other people. You know, the, the people who don't, they... Uh, I, I don't want to get into the whole evolutionary psychology aspect of it all, but the, the simple concept was that, you know, even though I don't believe in heaven or hell... You know, I'm not a bad person. You know, right. I, I do believe in consequences. Like, there's consequences to behavior. You know, if I mouth off the right, wrong person, I'll get my teeth knocked out. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> or if I break this law, I go to jail. Uh, but I don't think that my behavior is motivated by fear of punishment. You know, like, a Christian might be afraid of going to hell. You know, that doesn't make you good. Fear of punishment doesn't make you a good person. But doing good just for the sake of doing something good, that makes you a good person. And, you don't need religion for that. But uh, Terry was always um, making comments, but he didn't mean anything by it. Af after a while, he realized, you know, what I am. And right. uh, he, was all he was all right with that. But I know based on him that, you know, and he's out in Texas, which I guess is a little bit more understanding than the deeps of South right. Carolina. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so I, I really wonder how how it is to live in a place like that. Like, does everything shut down at nine o'clock? You know. And... Oh yeah, we can't we can't buy alcohol on Sundays, uh, and there's a blue law on Sundays where you can't even buy clothes or anything until one in the afternoon. The only thing you can buy is food and medicine on Sunday mornings. Whoa. And then, yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. And even, I mean, even though I'm in Ohio, we have the same uh, beer law, but only in certain. Like, certain counties. It's not right. all throughout Ohio. It's just certain places. Well, some of the counties here have banned the blue law, but I'm in one of them that said, no, we like that. We like, you know, Jesus didn't want us to buy clothes on Sunday mornings. Yeah, it seems some places, uh, churches are like McDonald's. Right. But... Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, in my lifetime, have experienced some prejudice from people in power who were mega-Christian, um... So I wondered, you know, if if I experienced that here in New Jersey. And by the way, I'm not proud of living in New Jersey. It's just where I live. Right. But I, I wonder <laughs> what it's like where, you know, it seems that life is more, you know, community based. Where you know you stand out if you're different. You know, or are you penalized for for being who you are? I'll tell you one thing. Uh, I don't get asked to donate money anymore. Now that I have tattoos, <laughs> now that I have tattoos and everything, they have the people out on Christmas ringing their bells, and they look at me and they completely look away and wait till I go by, which is a delight because I don't have any money to give them. <laughs> do you do you have people going door to door? For... Uh, yeah, but not in the area that I live in because uh, it's just kind of out in the boondocks, kind of. So, uh, but yeah, generally, yeah, there's people door to door trying to to spread the word, and it's it's Jehovah's Witnesses, it's it's every religion. All so right, well, in one week you can hear about everything. Oh, my movie Jesus is a total douchebag. The instead of a synopsis, it just has this word of advice. You know, 
next time someone knocks on your door asking to talk to you about Jesus, agree, but only if that person watches the movie. Yeah. So it, <laughs> it, 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 it begins with the Immaculate Conception. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, you know, I've always said, back then, virginity was measured by whether or not the hymen was intact. So in order for Mary to still be a virgin after, God must have had a really small and thin penis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why, why are people against divorce or marriage? Like, God got her pregnant and didn't marry her. Right. You know, he had some <laughs> other guy raise the kid. <laughs> so. So this whole, so the, time, the, this whole time, Mari has been God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that was question one. <laughs> oh! I, 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 all right. That was the, 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 the horrifying uh, thing. It, I don't think I've ever watched a movie that horrified me since I was a child, but Avatar horrified me. The first time I watched it, I walked out because I just couldn't take the social agenda. But I went back in because... I, I like 3D, and I just went in for the visuals. I was tuning everything out. Oh, I hate 3D. Uh, you hate 3D? <laughs> oh, it's but, the death of movies. <laughs> but, but, yeah, the, the, the social agenda, the oppressive social agenda just really horrified me that I'm living during this time. But still, I think it's better than, you know, maybe living in Nazi Germany. Right. I, I actually <laughs> you know, I, I worked in the theater, and I got to watch that movie for free, and I left an hour into it. I haven't seen it. I just saw the hour. Wow. Done. So I, they I do plan to buy it uh, for my collection, because I do like the visuals. It's just that, as I said, uh, it's, it's horrifying, the, the oppressive social agenda. Let's, uh, let's go to question two for you. <laughs> you have another hour? <laughs> yeah, we got another hour. <laughs> another hour? <laughs> Go ahead. What's uh what's the best movie you've seen in the last five years? Oh uh, there's a movie I saw almost on accident. There was a, a video place going out of business and each week movies were costing less and less. And in their final week they had some absurd uh like buy twenty movies for five ninety nine. Right. And so I was nineteen movies in and I couldn't decide on the twentieth. And there was this movie on the shelf called Time Crimes. The cover looked stupid. The synopsis. The guy with the red mask. Seemed stupid. I, I don't remember what it looked like. Yeah. Uh, but it sat on a pile for a while, and when I watched it, I, you know, it, it was a it's a low budget movie. And that doesn't turn me off, but um, it took a while to get into the the movie, you know, to buy into the rules of the movie. You right. know, like this is what the what it looks like, this is what it is. But uh, that was one of my favorites for a long time. And the reason why I'm pointing that one out is that I can't remember telling as many people about a movie as I did about time crimes, like ignore the stupidity of the title. Right. It, it's also in the Spanish language. I, I think it has subtitles. Right. I don't speak Spanish, so it must have subtitles. Yeah. Uh, but I really, really liked it. It was uh, unique. Although I then saw a movie called triangle, which is an American movie. That was a good movie. And I'm not, often. I'm not sure which one took ideas from the other, but there there are some similarities. But Time Crimes is the superior of the two. Well, what's I just uh, really got a big big uh, yeah. It made me think a lot. Yeah. Well, what's your favorite movie that you've worked on so far? Hmm. I have fun in all the movies except for the Scrumpled Employee. That, that's a movie I shot for somebody else. Uh, it's just that there are a lot of things that were very aggravating during the making of it. Right. Uh, and also, I had to work much harder for it because it was for somebody else. <laughs> right. But I I have fun in, in all the movies. Uh, this latest one, Jesus, the Daughter of God, I think is the most fun just because it's the freshest. Right. You know, I, I don't really have a memory uh, unless, you know... I have an orgasm for no reason or <laughs> or if something bad happens. So, 
you know, I would just say that, and it's only the default answer because it's the latest one. Wait, on one of your it's, sets, it's been a lot of have, fun. on one of your sets, did you have an orgasm for no reason? <laughs> well, I've been trying for a long time to have one just <laughs> for mental stimulation. <laughs> So I don't know if maybe I had done it with a hand and just forgot that my hand was on it, but uh, but I distinctly remember it just being the power of my mind. <laughs> it had nothing to do with the movie, so um, yeah. What? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I will guess the question and answer with the word locker. <laughs> Okay, that that doesn't really fit. <laughs> what, what what was the question? <laughs> what is the worst movie monster of all time? Locker. Ah. <laughs> Locker. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as much as I hate the first worst horror movie ever made, I liked the shit demon in it. Right. Because it was actually a uh, Raggedy Ann doll with chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and the teeth were corn kernels <laughs> and, and googly eyes uh, as a kid I, I, I watched monster movies and I loved them and then as an adult I saw how cheesy they were I'm, do you remember Land of the Lost The uh, not, I don't mean the Will Ferrell yeah. movie right, right. the TV show yeah. I love the sleeve stack but now they're comical I have a picture yeah. of Slee Stacks framed on my wall right in front of me. I, I was obsessed <laughs> with it when I was a kid. Or the Gorn on Star Trek. Right, yeah. <laughs> it, looks, it looks just like them. You know, they were cool, but, you know, now as an adult, you know, they're, they're just so fake. And at one time, that was, I don't know if that was groundbreaking, but those were the effects. Right. I don't know. I, I don't like those things out of nostalgia. I just like cheese, right. personally. I do, too. But but I would never say something's the worst monster because I like monsters. Well, that's a perfect lead into our next question: is what's the what's your cheesy guilty pleasure outside of the horror movies? Like, what movie would you consider to be a guilty pleasure that you wouldn't tell people you watch? Well, I don't really have a reputation to defend. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm a metalhead, but I like Duran Duran. Um, <laughs> you know, I have no problem saying that. Right. Um, recently, did I see something that you wouldn't think I would watch? Oh, I, I just got Babe on Blu-ray. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do. And it's awesome. There's the, that is amazing. I love that movie. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So I would say Babe because I actually just watched it. Good pick. What, uh... <laughs> So cute! About? How could you not like that? Oh, <laughs> that and mean, the voice! You know, sometimes there are puppets that have stupid voices. Right. You know, there's 3D uh, movies that have uh, bad voice, but the voice for Babe was perfect. So cute. Yeah. God damn, that was cute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you think about all the, the remakes in Hollywood right now? When I was younger, I saw Halloween, and it was so boring that I couldn't make it to the end. I was fast-forwarding. I, I couldn't take how boring it was. When I saw Rob Zombie's Halloween, I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I did, too. Um, and I know that it's very trendy to bash Rob Zombie, but uh, I hate his music. I, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Right. But... <laughs> He seems to be a creative spirit. You know, maybe not his music. His music is garbage, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you. Everyone bashes him, but I love... The Devil's Rejects is one of my favorite movies. So, yeah, I, I like that. I, I don't have a, a flat-out hatred or love of a remake. I just like things that I like. I can't help it. Right. You know, uh, I don't know... There was just a remake of uh, Total Recall. I hadn't seen the first one, and I was just going to let the, the remake go. I'd watch it on, on Blu-ray or something if I liked the original. And the original was pure idiocy. Yeah. <laughs> so I have no interest in, in seeing the remake. I don't know why they remade it. I don't know if Total Recall was actually a blockbuster, if it was really good, but 
Um, I don't see a, a point in that. I I didn't like any part of the movie. There's not one good thing for for me. Not even Quato. I, <laughs> I I don't want to say that you know for to generalize to the public, but personally, from what I need in a movie, I I can't imagine anything in in Total Recall being being worthy of a remake. So you're saying the three tits on that girl did not do anything for you. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite horror movie decade? Again, um, I'm not really faithful to anything other than what I like. Right. You know, it's not an era. I love Laurel and Hardy. Yes. I, I know. Have I saw everything. Them. I saw them in the movie. <laughs> I have everything, and it, in the beginning of my, I don't really want to say that I ever made slapstick, but I gave a lot of nods to them. Uh, it's just sad that there's nothing like Laurel and Hardy now. Uh, they weren't like the Three Stooges. The Three Stooges, it seemed like they couldn't wait to bonk each other or right. whatever. But with Laurel and Hardy, whenever the fact I sell Oliver Hardy... He was embarrassed. Right. You know, uh, they, so, and they were also endearing. You know, they, it, it just went beyond the, the physical and the music, the Hal Roach Studios. By the way, there's a band, a Dutch band, I think, called the Bohunks. Uh, well, I think they're Dutch. I know they're called the Bohunks. And I had permission to use their music. So I, I use it from time to time. It's the same kind of style. I don't know what. The, the genre of that music is, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, it really fits. But I'm not sure if it just fits that out of my own nostalgia or if it truly is the best music to put behind, you know, people falling down <laughs> right, or, or whatever. Um, but that would be the only decade or era type stuff that that I, I'm aware of. Like, uh, Hal Roach Studios also did The Little Rascals, and I also own everything that has Little Rascals or or the old gang. I don't, I don't know if that really means anything to some of your oh, yeah. listeners. Uh, definitely. Well, I know I know, you, I know. in your movie you had uh, Hardy, I think, I think he killed WD and raped WD, didn't he? <laughs> By the way, do you know how many <laughs> angry people contact me, ask me where the fuck did I get the Hitler doll? Oh my god, what the <laughs> fuck? That's fucked up. No, if if you don't know who Laurel and Hardy is, you're not American. <laughs> <laughs> that that's just uh What is it, uh, Fat Hitler? <laughs> that's that should be the next movie, I'm telling you. We're just, we're working on movie ideas for you on this show. Uh and then we got That actually would be funny to have a movie called Fat Hitler. <laughs> And he, hey, well, see, there's a thing called there's a thing called B-word fat, where when you pronounce like Batman, he'd be like Batman. So if you did that with Hitler, <laughs> you must kill the Jews. <laughs> like, you just never understand what he's saying. <laughs> and the last question we have, Stacey, you want to take it? I thought you said eight questions. It is eight questions. This is the eighth one. That was seven. Oh, okay. <laughs> Lay off me. All right. <laughs> What is something you've learned from horror movies? What is like? What is one thing you'll never do because you saw it in a horror movie? Oh, you mean like if you're trapped in a house with somebody or whatever? Yeah, like I'm never ever <laughs> gonna go caving. <laughs> I've never learned anything from horror movies because they're not realistic. You know, um, if I may talk about some of the sex horrors that that I've I've released. Uh, some of the comments are like, you know, there weren't creative kills. I'm like, I'm not making a, a Freddy Krueger or Jason movie. Right. You know, like, if I'm making a, a movie about a serial killer, you know, he's got his M.O. Right. You know? <laughs> and so that that's another thing that separates me. And I'm not saying it's it's a good thing, but I'd rather be truthful or you know, obeying the laws of reality than obeying the laws of cinema. You know, so if you really need to watch something like that, you know, go watch an action movie. If you want creative kills, go watch Friday the 13th or something like that. But if if you want to be disturbed, you know, it, another thing is the serial killers that who I picked aren't alpha males. You know, I always make sure that they're, you know, true to, to life. Like if if you met, 
an average serial killer, you wouldn't be afraid of the person. Because, well, I guess it depends on the, the serial killer, but, you know, it, it's not a person who would ever strike fear in you. You know, it's like a bottom feeder, you know. So I also, uh, from a movie-making point of view, never want to make a serial killer look cool. Like, I want to be like that guy. Right. You know, so... Um, it, it bothers me that movies like Breaking Her Will got banned in Canada because they just see it as a jerk-off movie. And although I, I've made movies like that, like I told you not to call the police and captive audience, they are they were made strictly to generate profit so I could make fucked-up comedies. Right. But Breaking Her Will had a story behind it, and I also wanted to see, you know, when when the villain cries, he's not crying for the reasons you think he is, but would you still have sympathy? And also, if you know his back, um, his history, you know, does it excuse what he does? You know, do you feel sympathy for him? You know, like, you and I, and I'm t- talking to you plural, right. um, we've faced rejection in our lives, but we've moved on. We might be sad about certain things, but we've moved on. But there are some people who, for some reason, uh, become extremely vindictive, you know, uh, they want revenge, they want power, uh, they have felt, you know, robbed of of this and that, you know. <clears throat> Clearly there's something wrong with those people, you know, and so do you look at people who torture as people who are sick and who who should be pitied? Right. <laughs> you know, maybe an average viewer wouldn't think that, but I, I, I was mad that, that that got banned, and it also got pulled from Amazon, but then some some vendors or some private sellers uh, listed it for double the retail value. Well, see, and that's, that and, sucks because that's the kind of movie that I like to get. Like, if I hear something's banned, that means I have to watch it. <laughs> oh, and then there's this new thing, new thing to me, but it has been going on for a while. I first heard of it, and I thought it was absurd that my movie Metalheads, uh, some people couldn't buy it because their credit cards considered it porn. And I didn't, I didn't know that, you know, porn was illegal. And yeah. I get, I guess in some areas of the country it is, but, you know, this one fan in New Jersey, his credit card wouldn't process the order for metalheads. And I didn't know at the time that there's a movement. Uh, <laughs> I don't know whether it's credit card processors or a credit card company will not fulfill an order, will not process an order if there's violence against women, unless it's got an MPAA rating of R or PG or, or whatever. Right. Uh, so Hollywood can make a movie like um, Last House on the Left. Yeah. Like that was in the theaters. Uh, so, you know, an underage girl gets raped in that. You know, that's fine. You, 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 can, buy, you can buy that. As, as a matter of fact, an underage person pro- could probably go into Best Buy and buy it. Irreversible. You know, cat, cat, I mean, catchers, you... I've seen Irreversible in Best Buy and everywhere, and that's that's yeah. probably the most violent rape scene I've ever seen in any yeah. movie. That, that was the first rape scene I ever saw that wasn't sex. <laughs> and I don't mean that to, as a joke. It's just right, right, right. usually rape scenes in, in B-movies are, are bad. They're laughable. Right. So, you know, me not looking at it as, like, a real act, you know, just see, like, this hot girl, like, ooh. And Monica you know. Belushi sold that. I mean, I felt like they were actually raping her on set. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but again, uh, breaking her will, um, that was the next hint that, you know, there's something going on that I, sh- I should know about because, you know, that movie is not like strictly pr- prurient, I guess is the word, where, you know, there is a story. I'm trying to tell a story. And I'm also tr- trying to show, you know, like Kill the Screen Queen showed something very true, like most girls who are getting into acting, they they don't have, you know, chaperones come with them. Right. You know, like, uh, you could be a stranger, you know. Uh, so I wonder why more of them aren't uh, attacked or, or hurt, you know. Models sometimes tell me that, you know, here and there they get mo- uh, fondled or, or whatever, and then right. they bark and then the person backs down. But, you know, it could be much more serious than that. Um. Anyway, getting back to the breaking her will, Ravage the Screen Queen was the next one that that got banned in Canada, 
and got removed from Amazon and, and stuff like that. And then this company, TLA, which sold huge amounts of my sex horrors, suddenly took all of my movies off their catalog and off their website. <laughs> and I thought that maybe I had said something in an interview that pissed them off um, or that maybe I didn't advertise, you know, because people get spiteful. Right. You know, but I was thinking like, you know, if they made that much money, wouldn't they just eat it? Like if they didn't like a comment I made. Right. Yeah, uh, exactly. But then um, one guy there explained that the credit card processor will not process any more. They, they had a contract with uh, the one guy who told me the situation said that their new contract with the. By the way, I'm not playing that music. I'm in a parking lot. I told you. Okay. <laughs> Do you hear any kind of dance music? <laughs> That's not me getting naked while I say this. Um, <laughs> Yet. <laughs> so, so, you know, that really messed me up. And um, so they said that if I get an MPAA rating, they could bring my movies back up. But until then, no. It's not worth the hassle, know. though. MPA is a joke. Yeah, that, that, that's all a scam. But um, the the positive side of all this is that uh, when I made Captive Audience and I told you not to call the police, I was worried about getting a reputation as a person who made those movies rather than as a person who made movies like Ant Farm Dickhole. Right. You know, that's what I want to be known for, making entertaining movies, not jerk-off movies. Right. So that pretty much forced my hand that I have to be who I am, you know, uh, because... When I make movies like I told you not to call the police, there's no difference between me doing that and making wedding videos. Right. You know, that's that's like movies for hire as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, all those people did was uh, bring me back to myself, making movies that probably are more vile <laughs> as far as they're concerned anyway. Like, the, I just hate the way things are going. I, I saw a Penn and Teller episode wherein... Apparently, the idea for political correctness came from a guy who studied the Nazis and decided to use their tools of manipulation for good. And manipulation is evil no matter what. Whatever your intentions are, manipulating people is not good. Right. So um, so that's why the cheesiest science fiction movie ever made has a little bit more bite to it than it normally would have had because I'm fed up. Because now it actually has eaten my wallet. You know, granted, I, I should have stopped making those movies anyway, but I really hate having someone else tell me that I can't do it. You know, I'll do it. I, I might make a movie so vile and put it up on a torrent, personally, free forever. Right. You know, how is that protecting the world? That's not protecting the world. That's just having stupid fucking control. You know, little dick syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Although, uh, if I ever make another uh, serial killer movie, well, I shouldn't say if. When I do, <laughs> the, be the, the beginning of it will actually say some things that should have been said in, in earlier movies that, you know, it's not cool to hurt women. You know, this is not a show, uh, a, a movie to glorify that. It's a movie to show something disturbing. Right. You know, um, but not it to glorify. You know, th things like that, but because before uh, on the beginning of movies, I know you put on the remake, you put Bills Above as a, as a sexy beast or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because a lot of people don't know, and, you know, I like to educate. Yeah, let people know. <laughs> I like people? to give positive messages. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, thank you. About myself and my movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending. I mean, you spent two hours with us. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Two hours, really? Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, and that's awesome. We, we, if, anytime you want to come back and talk with us, we'll <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are you doing in half an hour? Uh, it'll destroy the illusion, so... Uh, I just now realized, after all this time, that if you see that movie, the illusion's going to be destroyed, so I might as well have put it on the horror movie itself. 
Well, that's anyway. kind of like that Forgive Me for <laughs> Raping You movie. I mean, that movie went way away from your kind of typical horror movie comedy kind of thing. Yes. Uh, what can I say about that? I wish that we had more time to do it. I might have cast it differently, but uh, maybe it was experimental. I don't know. Is that one of the movies you've seen? Oh, yeah. I saw it last night. Okay. It was uh, yeah, the, it was a little different than what I was used to seeing from you. Yeah, well, I guess – how can I put this? All right, I just now parked, so I can give you my <laughs> full attention. Okay, cool. I'll take, <laughs> I'll take my seatbelt off. Ugh. All right. I accidentally discovered that the so-called sex horrors make a lot of money – and rather than being the kind of guy who makes movies for money, well, that came out wrong. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> yeah, all right. Uh, l- let me start that over again. The sex horrors, I found out, sell very well. But I didn't want to be known as a guy who makes roughies uh, as they're they used to be called in the 70s, although I think the movies I make are rougher than the roughies were. Right. Uh, anyway, I use the profit from those movies to make movies that are very high risk, and by high risk meaning they'll be banned or they won't sell at all. You know, movies like Rap Sucks, uh, Dirt Bags, where it's very questionable if they'll even get into stores. You right. know, so this way... I can make the movie and not care about anything. Right. You know, I just make the movie the way I want to make it. So, Which is why we have so much respect for you, because you just have the balls to do whatever the fuck you want to do. In a world where everyone's worried about what Hollywood thinks and if they're going to make money off of it, you just do what you want to do, and that's awesome. Exactly. Well, I have noticed going to horror conventions all over the country that independent movie makers are ashamed of being independent and they seem to be making demos for Hollywood, almost as if, you know, like, here's my movie. Uh, see, I, I abide by all your rules. Why don't you embrace me as one of your own? And that click is very hard to be part of. Right. You know, why not just enjoy your freedom? You're not going to make a name for yourself just following the rules. You know, uh, I take my cue from music. There are a lot of bands that in the beginning were hated, you know, what the hell are they doing? That'll never work. And they became forefathers. You know, I'm, I'm not saying that I'll ever be a forefather. but <laughs> Well, I mean, I think Stacy would agree that the independent scene, I think, is more alive than the mainstream scene. Because I think, uh, I, I know I do, I strive to see things that I've never heard of or things that I've never seen before. And you're not going to find that when you will go watch, you know, The Fucking Possession or something that, you know, Guillermo del Toro is putting out. It's the same shit over and over again, just revamped. Definitely. And that's what I look for in a movie. I look for something that's going to shock me. I don't know why, but that's what I want. I'd much rather see that than some scripted, terrible Hollywood movie. I don't know why. Just sometimes those budgets really... I mean, that's why when I see a film called Ant Farm Dickhole or Zombie Christ, I have to watch it because it's something I've never fucking heard of before. Exactly. <laughs> so <Yeah>, Ant Amp- <laughs> Farm Dickhole in a few months will be released in an alternate version called Human Ant Farm, and that's for the mainstream stores that were too afraid of the vulgar title. And the reason why it's an alternate version is I don't like to double-dip my fans. So, you know, every movie that I make, I try to have at least four different takes of each cut. So whenever you say somebody say... Whenever you see someone walk into a room,
welcome to PsyCal. I'm Kyle. And I'm Stacy. And this week we have a special guest, uh, Bill Zabub. Uh, if you do not know Bill, he makes um, I, I get... some of the craziest films you will ever ever see in your lifetime. Yeah, I don't know where the uh, thought process starts with someone like Ant Farm Dickhole and Jesus Christ Serial Rapist. Uh, he's definitely not for everybody. Um, but, I mean, mad respect for him for doing what he wants to do. Exactly. And, you know, I noticed he said he doesn't work with a budget. He's like, I have no budget. Right. That's, that's, like, he's like, I'm just doing what I want to do, and that alone. True envy. Yeah, 100% my respect for that. Yeah, and, well, the B-List movie scene, it's kind of big right now. There's a huge, uh, following with it, with, uh, Thanks Killing. The third one just came out. They skipped the sequel. But yeah, and it was amazing. <laughs> uh, with like Ginger Dead Man three, I mean, a lot of people like B list because they like laughing, but they like uh, monsters as well, I guess. Um, yeah, tra- and it's good. it's honestly really really hard to find good monster movies anymore because it just seems. I mean, it's yeah, just, ever since just, Poultry Guys, it seems like it just died out. Yeah, every <laughs> that's a excellent choice, I guess, but um. I don't know, like, it just seems like Hollywood is so into the remakes right now that, you know, anything original is either sitting on someone's desk and they're just ignoring it, but we just need a really good monster movie out there. Yeah, the only monster movie we have right now is uh, Guillermo del Toro trying to put out, um, fucking Ghost Mama. <laughs> yeah. Mama. I mean, there's there's no more monsters in movies, and, I, and uh, with Bill, he even brings out monsters from time to time with, like, Night of the Killer Pumpkin. Right, and that's 100% my respect, even if it's just this low-budget, put-a-pumpkin-on-somebody's-face type deal. Have you seen that movie? I have not. Oh my god, it's 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 ridiculous. <laughs> I would assume so. Just alone, like, I was watching interviews with Bill. I think he was at, oh, whatever conventions up, Cinema Wasteland up in Cleveland, and he was just having the time of his life down yeah. there. We're about to interview him now, um, so uh, I guess without further ado, let's get to the interview. So we are here with Bill Zabub, uh, and he is a horror icon in the... Would well, you like being called the king of B-list? <laughs> <laughs> king of Z-movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, everyone is calling... His new moniker, I guess, is the king of B-list. That's actually a movie coming out dedicated to you. Did you have anything to do with that? Oh, uh, let's see. What is the official story of that? Uh, a, a Victoria's Secrets model likes my movies, and after seeing my documentary, she decided I'll make one the same way, which means that it'll be bad. <laughs> and <laughs> see, I, so I, I I released some footage for that, and a lot of that footage is stuff that I guess you can call it bloopers or behind the scenes that was from my sex horrors. And the reason why they never appeared on Sex Horrors is that I didn't want to break the illusion. So um, the, the reason for that is, like, Breaking Her Will is a movie where uh, you're supposed to be disturbed the whole time. And if you see behind the scenes of us laughing, yeah. and, you know, it had Darian Kane and it had Susie Lorraine, and I forgot who else was in it. It had a grimoire girl. Grimoire girls were girls in my magazine. Right. That That's a whole other topic, but... Essentially, it was a practice movie, but I paid the girls to be in it, and that separates me from a lot of independent people, even people who make movies for profit, and that even as a student of film, I paid people to be in it. You know, if a girl's even in a bikini, she gets money. So um, that, I, I made a lot of VHS dubs, and it got into the hand of a distributor, and I was asked, you know, what do, what do I want for for the rights? Which was really bizarre because I was thinking like maybe in five years I'll be good enough to get distribution, but I got distribution on my practice movie. Right. Uh, by the way, that Metalheads is not the Metalheads that's available today. I remade it in uh, 2005, I think, because right. after the five-year contract was over, the distributor wanted to renew the rights, and I was thinking about just giving them a re-edit, and I looked at it, and I was thinking, oh, my God, this is terrible. <laughs> 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 I cannot let this continue. You kind of so pulled the uh, worst just... horror movie ever made. You remade the ah! <laughs> no, Okay, so I spent last night watching both of them, and, and you told me 
I, I'd seen the first, the original. I'd never seen the remake. And when I watched it, I was like, "You were so right. The remake is so different. It's, but it, it is a lot better." And it made me, it made me laugh. I was dying, I was dying laughing watching the remake. I'm so sorry that you watched the first one. <laughs> <laughs> that would, I was talked into releasing it under my name, but it was basically just some friends having fun over the winter. Um, cause at the time I was inexperienced and I thought, you know, it's February. We can't film anything. You know, obviously that's not true, but back then I didn't know. And so I had six weeks where I knew I'd be paralyzed. I had nothing to edit. So six weeks was all we had to write, edit, uh, write, film, and edit. And um, each we were supposed to replicate the movie. And for those of you who don't know who, repli- <laughs> who replicated, it's my uncle. No, uh, replicate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not burning a DVD. It's you know the factory stamped DVD. That's the uh, retail version. You know, it's not a burn. A- anyway, we're each going to contribute. You know, we began as 13 people, and it ended up being seven divided by 1,200 or how much, how much it cost. And we each got our own allotment. And then um, because they fooled me into putting my name on the movie, uh, the distributor wanted it. Uh, the reason why I'm staggering is I don't want to tell the story. I don't want people to <laughs> go out and find that version. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but basically, I, I'm ashamed of it. I, I wouldn't be ashamed of it as a home movie or something that was fun for friends to do. Right. Uh, you know, to pass time, but that's not really something um, for fans. The remake. You know, or, or for the general public. <laughs> and like you said, the remake was was so much better and it was I mean in, in the I think the comedy in it was so much it was delivered so much better, you know what I mean? It's cuz I actually put effort into it. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you know, I was so desperate to have the first version destroyed that uh I told Netflix, the, the guy who worked there at the time, uh the acquisitions guy, listen, if you send back the first version, I will send you double the amount in the new version. Right. You know, the I will admit one thing that you might find interesting about that whole fiasco. Until then I had not made a horror movie. And I was just dreaming of the day when horror critics would would have a horror movie for me to, to write about. Horror sites. Because I, I I was going to horror conventions selling comedies, which it was really funny. It was also aggravating the people who are next to me watching comedies outsell their horror movies. <laughs> but, but, but anyway, Netflix immediately wanted 900 copies of the movie when it came out. And then a week later wanted 800 more. And so I could have ridden that cash cow because, it, you know, if Netflix was, was ordering that amount, Imagine what everybody else would want. Right. But then I happened to read a review from a, a horror writer. I usually don't read. Yeah, or, uh, you, you can't reviews. read reviews. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's different from fans or people personally writing to me because I, I think that I learn from criticism, and I also want to know what makes people angry. But <laughs> uh, the review was spot on. You know, there was... Uh, I didn't take insult to it. I, I almost felt like apologizing to the guy for making him watch <laughs> such a bad movie. But but I realized that that was career suicide. If any more of those copies get out, and if people equate my name with that movie, I, I'm finished. So uh, I destroyed everything I had, except for one, just as a reminder, never do this again. Uh, but I wanted <laughs> Netflix to get rid of all theirs. Uh, ev- every appeal I made to them to just destroy them, I'll, I'll replace them, sell on deaf ears. Uh, I think Netflix has both copies or both versions available. I-, I wanted to ask fans to rent the first one and then scratch it so it's unplayable. <laughs> but I think 
that I would be liable if if I actually went ahead with that request. But I, I am ashamed of it. And people seem to have great delight bringing that first version to me at horror conventions for me to autograph. <laughs> it's just, it's just kind of rubbing it in your face. You hate this. Uh, hate this. <laughs> well, it, it's just like buggy potty training or a house training where you rub his nose into the right. crap <laughs> and he won't do it again. So I will never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to get the next one, Stacy? Is she there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. I'm sorry, I had my mute button on. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm a I'm a woman trying to figure things out, I guess. But um, at least you know. Yeah, I do know. I'm aware. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I know you say you don't like to uh, read reviews that much. But have you ever gotten like somebody that's just like full on rage with one of the movies <laughs> that you made? Uh, back in the days of MySpace being um relevant. I had about 13,000 friends. I, I don't know how many friends are on there because pretty much logging in there is just asking for spam. Nothing <laughs> else. It's <That's> true. <laughs> um, so I rarely go on there. I know that people in other countries still use it. So just in case somebody from <laughs> somewhere else is trying to contact me, uh, I, I log in. But I think the the name of the site is somethingawful.com. And I guess one of their writers or one person with the site noticed that I had a pretty sizable following and decided to review a movie. And the movie that he decided to review was that very first movie, Metalheads, which, as I said <laughs> before, was my practice movie. It wasn't the remake. And... The person hated the movie so much. He began the review by saying it was a waste of time to watch, but his review was so long that scrolling down forever led to a page two. It was so long that I couldn't even <laughs> oh my read God. it. <laughs> what movie room that's been filmed four times? You know, right. each shot is like that. So I'll, I'll try to put in shots that you've never seen, um, and maybe you have a different bonus movie. So if you are a fan and you see that and you're thinking, wow, I've never seen this before and you don't read the synopsis. Um, you know, you won't feel fooled at, at the end of the day when you, when you get home, you'll be happy that you have something a, a bit new. Well, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Uh, how did you get into the horror world? What made you want to uh, make movies? Well, the very, very beginning was when I received a video camera as a gift the first thing I did was go out in public and I interviewed people. That's actually preceding my magazine. And I think that that was how I developed my style of sort of being normal in the beginning and then getting very odd, you know, seeing how far I can push people. Right. <laughs> so uh, I I'd interviewed people in malls saying that I'm a college student. And then when I had two hours of footage, I'd, contact everybody who participated and then give them a dub. And then that went into uh, public stunts. I, I've always known derelicts. Uh, I've been a derelict myself, but uh, there are limits to the amount of damage my body can take. I've done that too. Uh, my, my knees are terrible yeah. right now because I'm getting hit by a car. <laughs> well, you know, um, it, it wasn't unique to us. You know, when Jackass became popular, a lot of people said they, they were ripping me off, and what they didn't understand is, you know, m maybe if you're sheltered or if, if that doesn't occur to you, you know, that that's one thing, but people all over the country have have done things and filmed them or, or videotaped them, you know, back in the days of, of videotape. So I, I wasn't angry. Jackass never ripped me off, you know. It, I don't have a monopoly on going into supermarkets dressed as an old lady or whatever. Right. <laughs> uh, like knocking down displays and, and things like that, falling downstairs. But every young uh, male has done that kind of shit before. I mean, it, and they just had they just had the know how to go. You know, we can film this and make money on it. Yeah, exactly. We were well, doing it for free. We were stupid. <laughs> well, uh, I was doing that for free too. We were basically just entertaining ourselves. Uh, I was editing from VCR to VCR. And then one day at a party, 
there are, I don't know. Uh, there are a lot of people who are in these public stunts, and they hadn't seen any of the footage. And I just asked if I can go into a room, turn on the TV, and, and put the VHS into the, <laughs> the VCR. I know those those terms might lose some of your younger audience. They're but... archaic now. Yeah, no one knows what the <laughs> fuck that is. Yeah. So uh, anyway, by the end of the tape, most of the people in the party were trying to get into the room. People were howling. And it occurred to us that this is funny to people outside of us. And so I, I stupidly abandoned the the public pranks and I started making skits. They're just odd skits. And, and they were bad because I, I didn't really know what the structure of a story should be or a structure of a skit should be. I just started it as strange. It got stranger and that ended in a way that, you know, you can never predict but it wasn't really good story writing. I thought to make something funny, you cram as much jokes into it or in a, as much funny stuff as possible. I didn't know that it actually had to have a story flow. And I guess you could say the same thing about my movies now. But <laughs> 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 but, but fast forwarding many years of doing stuff like that, um, I was talked into making a full length movie by a scream queen. And she said that she'd help me out and she'd get her friends to help out and that um, it probably will get picked up if they're in it. And so, I, as I said before, I, I didn't really know how to make a skit, let alone a full-length movie, so I, I bought a book by Sid Field about screenwriting, and I wrote Metalheads, and I filmed it as a practice movie, 